All right, now that John Ladd is here, we can get started. John is the administrator of the Office of Apprenticeship, has been helping scale apprenticeship in the U.S. for quite a while. Uh, well, welcome and good morning. Uh, I'm Bob Lerman, an Institute Fellow here at Urban Institute, and I want to thank everyone today for joining us on this uh, very cloudy and rainy day with a lot of traffic probably, uh, as well as thanking uh, our online audience for joining us today. Um, I encourage everyone in the audience to continue the dialogue by sharing your thoughts or observations on social media using the hashtags live at urban, uh, uh, well, the number thing and then live at urban, uh, the thing TAFE, hashtag, I guess, that's the term, uh, and uh, T-A-E-F and hashtag N-A-W, National Apprenticeship Week. Um, so include the speakers' uh, Twitter handles displayed on today's agenda. Um, as I said, I'm welcoming the virtual audience uh, watching over the webcast live stream. If you're tuning into the webcast, submit questions, if you have any, uh, to events at urban.org. You can do it at any time. Uh, that's the advantage of being online. You won't interrupt us by uh, doing that. So at Urban, of course, we, we believe that data, facts, and evidence matters. Uh, we're trying to use good information and analysis uh, to make the world a better place. And one of the big areas that increasingly people are believing in can make the world a better place is a scaled up apprenticeship uh, program. So, or system actually. So today um, we have a low level of apprenticeship um, and, uh, but I think that the policymakers' low level of interest in apprenticeship, they're beginning to change, both the low level and the policy interest. Uh, we do have a low level. We have uh, about 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 percent of our workforce in apprenticeships as compared to about 2 to 3 percent in some of our competing countries, which is about 10 times our scale relative to their workforce. Um, and until recently in the U.S., we were known for having high quality programs only in the building trades and not, not very many other places. Funding has been minimal for many, many years. The uh, number of people in the Office of Apprenticeship dwindled over the last decades by, I think, about two-thirds. Um, there was enough money to support one person in Ohio to look at, to promote and audit and examine apprenticeship. Um, and we have the issue of uh, policy researchers defining skill as academic achievement. It's just that APAM and saw a presentation by an outstanding young scholar, but when he looked at the trend and when he tried to identify the trend in skills, he used the trend in BA completions, uh, totally ignoring employability skills and occupational skills. And so there's been a general interpretation in the United States that this rising gap between college and high school graduates is a result of very good returns to college, whereas it could be that it's very low returns to the non-college skill development group. And I think that uh, is something that researchers have not really confronted. But we're witnessing a lot of movement um, from the federal and state governments to foundations, nonprofits. Two presidents now have endorsed a scaled up apprenticeship system. Um, and why is that? Well, it might be 
because of the benefits to individuals, companies, government, but it could also be because of the failure of a lot of other alternatives. And what that, that's a big role in how uh, we've increased the interest in apprenticeship. Um, as you know, I've been um, arguing, many of you know anyway, I've long pushed for expanding apprenticeship as a way of widening the routes to rewarding careers, especially among those who learn best by doing. I think apprenticeship is fundamentally about learning. Uh, people tend to forget that. And when apprentices complete, they really have demonstrated that they've learned how to learn as well as taking pride in their occupational accomplishments. But for apprenticeship to work well in the United States, uh, assuring quality must be paramount, must ensure that apprenticeships carry a reputation for high levels of competence and even mastery, must ensure that certifications of completion are credible, and guarantee that the programs teaching apprenticeship are well conceived. So how we do that, how do we assure quality, that's the subject of today's fourth annual Transatlantic Forum. Um, if we think about the elements of quality, uh, I think of it, uh, different people categorize it in different ways, but I think of it as first and foremost having high quality standards, frameworks, material that people uh, can uh, aim for to achieve uh, in, ach in, in completing their apprenticeship, demonstrating that they can do some things very well that are uh, recognized as required in that occupation. Uh, a second part is making sure that the trainers uh, whether they be uh, training on courses or training um, on the job, do a very good job, that, th that there's a way of assuring that they do a good job, whether it's training the trainers, auditing, whatever it might be, and we'll go into that today. And then the third thing is assessing the apprentices themselves. Um, how do we know that someone who went through a particular program has mastered that program. So I think of those as the three most important uh, broad areas. Uh, we at Urban are trying to uh, work on a few of these things, uh, most especially uh, through a contract with the Department of Labor uh, to create high quality competency-based occupational frameworks for apprenticeship. And you can see those at our Urban Institute website, which has uh, Urban Institute um, in the features page on apprenticeship, or you can just Google Urban Institute competency-based uh, frameworks. Uh, I'd like to recognize Diana Elliott here, who's running that project. She's doing a great job. And I think what you'll see there is just the start of an effort that already is well underway in, all, in almost all the other countries. So we have a great lineup today, starting with my good friend, Tom Buick, who is the CEO of the Federation of Awarding Bodies. Uh, he'll tell you what that is, I suspect. Uh, Tom has a, a long career, uh, both in public service and in public policy and even in helping the United States uh, move forward in apprenticeship uh, and, and partly, and is partly responsible, I would say mainly responsible, for having these transatlantic forums. So Tom, step to the podium and let's move this uh, project along. Thank you. Bob, thank you very much indeed for that uh, kind introduction. It's always a, uh, a pleasure and a privilege to follow you. I mean, you can go anywhere across these lands um, and you could speak to stakeholders and uh, policymakers involved in apprenticeship. And after you said the word apprenticeship, 
usually you'll get the words Bob Lerman after it. And um, that just goes to show, I think, the contribution that Bob has made over many years. In fact, Bob once dusted off a copy of his, uh, his book on youth apprenticeship, which he, he wrote in the, uh, the early 1980s. And I had to sort of point out to Bob that... Uh, 1990. Well, I, I was still in high school then, so, uh, Bob, I think that gives you a sense of this intergenerational pact that uh, exists, not only in this country on apprenticeship, but, of course, as Bob quite rightly w um, said, we've, we're now in our fourth annual Transatlantic Apprenticeship Exchange Forum. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there was a time when, uh, particularly around these parts, if you said the British are coming, it had a sort of different set of connotations. So it's... Uh, particularly good to see that these days it means that we come in friendship, we come in trade, we come uh, to engage with you in this really important question of how do we deliver for our populations a route into the workforce that complements, not necessarily replaces, but complements uh, four-year college or three-year degrees as we would call them in the UK through this high quality learn and earn route. It's also great today to be joined by uh, colleagues from um, Canada, uh, Sarah you'll hear from uh, later on one of the panels uh, and also from the uh, Swiss Embassy as well. We have Marty here uh, from the Swiss Embassy. I'm particularly proud of that point because I'm the father of uh, um, uh, two daughters, lovely daughters who are both British and Swiss nationals. In fact my wife did one of the famed Swiss apprenticeships and we often uh, you know, discuss around the kitchen table whether or not one day, by the time our daughters are ready to leave school, there'll be anything like the Swiss apprenticeship model uh, for them to potentially graduate into. So this is very much a transatlantic uh, dialogue. It's about learning from each other uh, as we find our way uh, in this important endeavour. Now, last year when I spoke at this podium, uh, I talked about the uh, expansion effort in relation to English apprenticeships. It's worth just emphasizing here, although this is a British delegation, when we talk about apprenticeships, it's a four country model. So you have 50 countries within one state here that are involved in apprenticeships. In the United Kingdom, we have, of course, uh, England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. But I talked about the uh, tenfold increase in apprenticeships that had occurred between the late 1990s and the sort of mid 2000s. Uh, and that was very much a debate, I suppose, about <clears throat> quantity, because also the subject of last year's apprenticeship forum was uh, about the moonshot goal, you know, the, the famous uh, <laughs> Bernie off comment to President Trump about, well, why don't we aim for uh, five million apprenticeships in the US by 2022? So that was the quantity debate. I think this year what we thought we'd focus on is really the flip side of that coin, which is quality, because I think we'd all agree, anyone that's been involved in apprenticeship, just merely focusing on quantity and pumping out the number of apprentices is not the same for your skills base, your productivity, for your long-term prosperity of having a quality apprenticeship system. So for those of that, that are familiar here with the Presidential Task Force report, 27 or so recommendations, a 51-page report, I was very struck by, in quotes, what it said about uh, quality apprenticeships. Fundamental to the success of apprenticeship is a high-quality and structured learning experience. And I really would encourage you to just remember those lines as we go through the discussion today, because I think not everything can be apprenticeship. Not all training is apprenticeship, and I think we have to hold on to that idea. In relation to the English um, apprenticeship model, um, Simon Ashworth from the um, Association of Employment Learning Providers, who's here, and myself have, have written a paper, so feel free to take that paper away. So we're not going to cover all of the detail, but that sort of takes you through what we mean by quality in the English uh, apprenticeship model. I just want in the last sort of three or so minutes left to me just to go through, because we're going to be talking obviously about the English model today, but also about the experience here in the United States and indeed other countries around the world, but really just for the benefit of those of you who aren't familiar with the English model, um, just to run you very, very quickly through what I would call our system architecture, because you will hear fellow um, British speakers will probably refer to one or more of these organisations. So really what I wanted to do is just give you a sense of when you talk about the English apprenticeship model, you have to look at it really in four different guises. 
The first is around uh, the policy and funding regime. Who pays for our apprenticeships? Well, the simple answer to that is employers now pay for our apprenticeship model because the government's in, uh, introduced, that's Her Majesty's Treasury, a piece of legislation where employers, large employers, have to pay 0.5% uh, of their payroll towards the National Apprenticeship Fund. And that fund, by the way, is $3.18 billion, or it was against the exchange rate when I checked it last week, but we've had a bit of a hiccup with the Brexit negotiations and the dollar pound has uh, tanked a bit in the last couple of days. So, But broadly, $3 billion uh, is what we spend, and that comes from the large employers, but it's spent on apprenticeships in large and small and medium-sized enterprises. So that's the question, who pays? The um, regulatory and sanctions regime is important for us, and we'll unpack that a bit, but there are several organisations that are involved in quality assurance. The quality of the training is assured by Ofsted, which is a public organisation, and the, um, if you like, the standards that are developed, the competency standards that Bob referred to, uh, they are developed by the Institute for Apprenticeships, and we're going to hear from the Chief Executive of our Institute for Apprenticeships via video very shortly. He will say more about the Institute for Apprenticeships role. Um, so really it's that third box, standards and quality assurance, that's where most of the discussion is going to take place over the two panels, uh, un unpacking that a bit and talking about in particular a very new reform for the English apprenticeship model which is called endpoint assessment and you're going to hear from an endpoint assessment organisation. What's um, fascinating for me about having uh, a representative from Canada in the room is that England and Canada are the only two countries in the world that operate an endpoint assessment form of uh, assessing apprenticeship proficiency and mastery. So I think that could be quite interesting for um, American and other audiences. And then where the real action takes place, of course, the operational and service delivery. And that could be through our, uh, our own version of the community colleges, as well as workforce intermediaries, also known as independent training providers. And it's worth emphasizing that in our apprenticeship model, 76% of all apprenticeship training is actually supported by the independent, voluntary and private sector. Only 24% is actually delivered by our community colleges and that's something um, which again is very different from how things run here. Employers as well, they can also be direct providers of training uh, for the apprenticeships, both the off the job and on the job, but they will be subjected to the same quality assurance regime as our public sector and other um, colleagues that are involved in delivering training as well. But again, we'll unpack pack that on the panels. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm going to uh, now just run the video. Hello, Jerry everyone. Berrigan. Hello. My name is Jerry Berrigan. I'm the Jerry Berrigan. Chief Executive of the Chief Institute for Apprenticeships here in England. Here in England. And, I the and I welcome the opportunity to contribute to the fourth to the annual fourth Transatlantic annual Transatlantic Apprenticeship, Forum, Apprenticeship Forum taking place this week, taking place this uh, week during what is the uh, American what is National the Apprenticeship American National Week. Apprenticeship I'm delighted the delegation of British delegation training providers British and experts providers have been able to come across the Atlantic to join you this week, led by Tom Buick. All of them have a good track record of sharing their unique expertise and experience, and experience in expanding, in expanding, and expanding and improving and our country's improving apprenticeship, our country's model. apprenticeship model. It's important to encourage important transatlantic, to encourage dialogue, transatlantic of dialogue of this nature between, this our, two nature countries. between our two countries. Learning from each other learning from as, we, each seek other, to grow the as skills, we seek to grow the skills and the respective work and the respective forces by a better and higher quality, quality apprenticeship, system. apprenticeship system. I'm aware that following I'm the aware that following your presidential task force on apprenticeship expansion, growing your apprenticeship model is a paramount importance. And I know from my military from background, military background, background that apprenticeships, that work. apprenticeships work. They can provide opportunities to tens of thousands of young people and adults with the skills to succeed. To succeed. They can allow people to earn while they learn and achieve objective validation of what they've achieved, which is a level of proficiency and skills that are really valued by industry. No nation can afford to stand still. Developing the human capital of our people in an interconnected and globalised economy is what will define our future productivity and ultimately the living standards that we all enjoy. Six years ago, England embarked on the process of reforming our apprenticeship model. The organisation that I the lead, the that Institute I lead, for Apprenticeships, Institute for Apprenticeships was, established by was established by Parliament in April last year, in April last year to help play a leadership, help role, play a leadership role working with employers, working with employers training providers, training providers and, apprentices and, and apprentices themselves. 
And by empowering employers, by empowering employers we work with industry we groups with industry to create groups, the right apprenticeship the standards, right apprenticeship and, standards assessment and assessment plans that our apprentices will, that then, our undertake apprentices will then undertake to be become fully proficient in fully proficient currently in currently over 300, over 300 occupational, roles. occupational roles. Like Canada, like Canada we've separated the role separated of those providing the training those providing from those, the training, those who measure whether, who measure the, required whether the required skill standards of the apprenticeship have, have, been, met. have been met. In other words, in training words, providers will no longer mark their own homework. The quality of the training, the is, independently of the training is independently assessed by a public body, by a public called, body Ofsted. called Ofsted and the proficiency of the, the apprentice, proficiency is, of the apprentice is decided by an endpoint assessment, end assessment which, is which is undertaken by one of over 150, 150 government approved, government or, approved uh, assessment, or, organizations. Uh, assessment organizations. Here at the Institute, here at the Institute quality, apprenticeships quality apprenticeships are at the heart of everything, we do. Of everything we do. So how do we so how quality, do assure, we quality England's assure England's system? apprenticeship system? Well, we work in partnership, well, we work in partnership with all of the other regulatory, all bodies, of the other regulatory bodies in this area through something, this area, called, through the something alliance, called the Quality Alliance, which I chair. Alliance, which I chair. The, alliance also includes, the Alliance also includes, as observers and contributors, as observers and contributors the membership bodies, membership bodies representing, training representing training providers, training providers and, the awarding and the awarding organizations. The Alliance started out alliance by agreeing out by the key agreeing elements the key of what elements a quality apprenticeship, what a quality is. apprenticeship is. A job with training, a job with to, industry training standards. to industry standards. It should be about it entry be to about a recognised occupation, occupation, involve a substantial programme on, program on the job and off the job training, and the apprentice's and the occupational, occupational competence should, should be tested by an independent, by an independent end point assessment. End point assessment. Apprenticeships, apprenticeships are employer-led. Employer -led. Employers set the standards, create the demand for apprentices to meet their skills and needs. They needs, fund those apprenticeships, fund those apprenticeships and, are responsible and are responsible for employing and, for employing training, the and training the apprentices at the end. At the end. But the needs of the apprentice the needs of the themselves, themselves, are equally themselves, themselves are equally important to achieve competence and skilled occupation, skilled occupation which, is transferable, which is transferable, secures for them long-term long earnings, long earnings, potential, earnings potential and greater security and, greater security, and the capability and to, the progress capability within the to progress within the workplace. The Alliance is now working, on a, now working strategy on a quality strategy to ensure that all apprenticeships, all meet, apprenticeships a meet a minimum standard. Thanks again for inviting Thanks me to contribute to the Transatlantic Forum's Trans deliberations, Forum's today. deliberations today. And I really look forward to hearing really about, forward to hearing the, outcome about of your debates. the outcome of your debates. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure uh, Sir Jerry will appreciate that round of applause travelling through the... Uh, Wi-Fi and internet, um, but uh, that was the head of our uh, Institute for Apprenticeships. It's a new organisation. It's only been going uh, for less than two years, and it's interesting actually that both the chief executive and his chief operating officer both have a distinguished background in the British military. I think that might tell you something about the minister's expectations in Her Majesty's government about the uh, efficacy of our new apprenticeship reforms. I think there's a real zeal there to drive through these changes with a focus on quality as well as quantity. And as uh, Sir Jerry was really mentioning there, one of the big changes is this shift to an end point assessment. Uh, and that's what we're gonna hear uh, from, from Thomas uh, Burton very shortly from the uh, awarding organization, NOCN. Bob, in your introductory words, you said I might say something about my day job back in the United Kingdom as Chief Executive of Federation Awarding Bodies. So essentially, that's uh, right, I represent um, over 150 uh, essentially credentialing organisations that are responsible for both academic and vocational qualifications. Uh, my members at the Federation of Awarding Bodies certified uh, over 13 million people last year uh, in everything from air traffic controllers to health and safety executives right through to uh, the equivalent of our high school uh, matriculation examination system. Now, it's a great privilege to introduce our next speaker. I will filibuster uh, a bit for you if you want, Senator, while you have your breakfast, but <laughs> he's also uh, going to speak uh, now about uh, the experience of Maryland. Uh, Senator Rosenpep uh, is in the Maryland State uh, Senate. He's been very proactive in uh, putting through legislation, uh, often bipartisan legislation, to help create the legislative framework for apprenticeships in Maryland, and I'm sure he's going to give us an update now and tell us all about how it's going. Jim, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. It is, it is an honor to be back with you. Um, let me ask you a question, first of all. Who here has been to Maryland? Raise your hand if you've been to Maryland. Let's have a round of applause for everybody who's been to Maryland. Now, who hasn't been to Maryland? Raise your hand. You're all invited. Round of applause. So on, either on this trip, I know you're going to Missouri, but the next time you need, you need to come back to Maryland, 
It's a wonderful state. Um, and uh, we are learning a lot from our friends uh, in the United Kingdom. And I think it's three. I think it's three years ago. Is that correct? I think when uh, Bob invited me to come to to, to this uh, conference, and we worked out a range for a group uh, from the UK under Tom's leadership to come to Maryland for a day and a half, and we put on a series of meetings with um, employers, unions, government people, education folks, to bring the joy of um, uh, British apprenticeships to uh, Maryland. And the result of that was that the apprenticeship movement in Maryland, let me put it that way, I'll come to the specifics, really sort of took off as a result of that. And it took off in a whole variety of interesting different ways. One was certainly on the legislative side. We have passed since then two pieces of legislation in various ways trying to expand and promote apprenticeships. Uh, we create, I think we became the 12th or 13th state in the United States to create a tax credit for employers uh, for when they create apprenticeships. We passed legislation to create what we call youth apprenticeships, which are apprenticeships for high school students. As you know, in the United States, high school goes through age 18, and so this is for 16 and 17 year olds uh, to be doing appre apprenticeships that are regulated in a different way than what we call registered apprenticeships here, which is traditionally for, for adults. I could go on and on and on. One thing we did that turns out to have been more important than many of the other things we did is we required that our State Department of Education in their annual evaluations of high schools give equal weight in the accountability system to the percentage of kids who were doing youth apprenticeships and other kinds of workforce training as they gave to what we call advanced placement exams, which are college uh, uh, courses taken in high school. And we put that in because we just thought it made sense, put work uh, workforce training and apprenticeships on, on an even playing field with degree programs. Uh, but educators being what they are, when they saw this, they were like, oh my god, we got to scale up the number of youth apprenticeships we have. And so the result is, and it's very exciting actually, is we now have, I think, six, eight of our school systems, we only have 24 school systems, that this year have launched youth apprenticeships across a whole variety of industries. And the one that I'm most proud of is my home county of Prince George's County, named after a Dane, not after a Brit. Um, that um, we are launching our school systems, the 25th largest school system in the United States. We're launching our first youth apprenticeship this year, and actually tonight I'm going to the launch of it. And it is for building maintenance workers in the school system. So the school system is the employer <laughs> so, working to solve its own uh, training needs. Uh, so a lot's going on, and you all helped us get off the ground. So I just want to thank all the folks from across the pond who, who helped us with that. Now, I know the topic today is quality, and that's generally not my thing, uh, but I'm really pleased that other people it's their thing. Um, well, I say that because my experience in promoting apprenticeships um, in Maryland over 25 years with 22 years of failure and now, 20, and now three years of success has to some extent been around the issue of quality. And the way it plays out in my experience is that in the United States you have what are often called traditional apprenticeships, which are construction industry apprenticeships, which are generally uh, run by, driven by, have been for decades, um, joint union management committees in the industry. The carpenters, the plumbers, the, uh, the electricians. Don't forget the electricians, absolutely. Um, and what I like to say is the union apprenticeship programs in the United States are the gold standard of apprenticeship. They're high quality. They're people who actually know how to fix the plumbing and actually know how to do the electricity. And they have a funding mechanism that is self-sustaining because the union contracts require that a certain number of cents per hour go to the Joint Labor Management Committee for paying the costs of the apprenticeship program, and the apprenticeship program does the recruitment. So it's, it's a self-perpetuating, very successful model. That's great. They also, politically, uh, the union programs have tended to dominate 
the apprenticeship uh, and training councils at the state level and certainly do in Maryland. And over the years, they have not been enthusiastic about expanding apprenticeships. And they've not been enthusiastic about expanding apprenticeships uh, because they're afraid that nobody can do it as well as they can, which may very well be true, but is actually not a, a useful strategy for the long run. And so 20 years ago, when I tried to push uh, to expand apprenticeships, at that time mostly on the youth apprenticeship side, but in the non-traditional areas as well, um, the pushback was from the traditional union uh, management committees uh, that if you expand apprenticeships into other fields, it's going to destroy the brand. It's going to destroy quality. So literally when I said that I've not been a big champion of quality, I have actually not been a big champion of quality. I'm like, I'm for quality, but we don't need to worry about the quality of our IT apprenticeships if we have no IT apprenticeships. We don't need to worry about the qu qu quality of our healthcare apprenticeships if we have no healthcare apprenticeships. So I have been um, sort of agnostic and flexible on that issue um, as the debate's gone forward. It's actually been a healthy debate because as we debate these apprenticeship issues, those guys come in and say, look, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do the next thing. And then other people come in and say, well, you don't need to do it exactly the way they do it in the building trades. And it's frankly been kind of a healthy debate in Maryland. So where it's ended up at this point, it's got a long way to go. It's a couple of places. One is, uh, and this was not controversial, but it was important, is because we have this system of registered apprenticeships in the United States, and we created this parallel system in Maryland of registered youth apprenticeships. They're registered separately, same regulatory body, same concept, but different. Because in a traditional apprenticeship, it's 2,000 hours of work, 144 hours of uh, related instruction. In the youth apprenticeship, because these kids are still in high school, and we take the past couple, last couple of years of high school pretty seriously in the United States, it's 500 hours of work during the year. And it's integrated with um, related instruction. So it's a different structure, but, con but conceptually it's, it's similar. Um, so one of the things we said was that to be an apprenticeship in Maryland, it has to be a registered apprenticeship. When we created the tax credit uh, for registered apprenticeship, we said you can't get the tax credit unless it's a registered apprenticeship. And so that ended up being one compromise on quality. Now that you're going to ask the question is how do we make sure the registered apprenticeships are high quality? That, that definitely is an implementation issue. But the concept that it's got to be registered under the traditional rules and laws we have in the United States and in Maryland was one step towards dealing with quality. The second issue, which is very much in play right now as we speak, is, and this is something that's really helped uh, in terms of moving the conversation forward, is because we have, as I've learned, a much more robust and extensive career and technical education infrastructure in the United States in our high schools. In Maryland, 23% of high school graduates in Maryland last year graduated with either an industry credential, a youth apprenticeship, or completed a career and technical education program. Now, what does completing a career and technical education program mean? It means you've taken probably three or four courses uh, in a field. It may be in um, a certified um, nursing assistant. It may be in auto repair, whatever. And it's, it doesn't get you to the master level. You're not like a master electrician or whatever. But you complete a course of study to a certain point that the State Department of Education has said you have completed this course of study successfully. 23% of our high school graduates last year did that. What's interesting, which makes me very optimistic, is while that's the average for the state, we have one county in the state where 70% of the high school graduates had done one of those things. We also have a, a jurisdiction in my state, my jurisdiction, where only 11% had. So when people say, well, this doesn't fit with American culture, this won't work, I'm like baloney. Uh, it's about whether the institutions focus on the needs of the students and, and needs of the employers and needs of the economy. The reason I give you that background is the state has set up a very big study commission, like you all have in the UK as well, on K through 12 education. And it's mostly focused on early childhood education and, and teacher preparation and what do we do to help poor kids and all the normal stuff in education. 
But because of the work, frankly, that, that Bob and the Urban Institute have done and so many of you in this room for the United States have done, for the Labor Department and others and our friends from the UK, apprenticeship is very much on the agenda of how do we fix K-12 education. So it's not, it's not like over there with the workforce people. It's with the education people, which is where all the money is. And so we've had really a, a year of meetings and hearings on this. Um, and where we are right now is an interesting debate, is the staff for the commission is very big on quality. They are like in your space. And so they proposed we should set up a Maryland State Skills Board, basically modeled on the UK. At which point, my friends in the traditional apprenticeship said, what? What? We already have a quality system. It's called registered apprenticeships. And so we have worked out a compromise right now, may hold, may not hold, that says that the skills board will develop the standards for career and technical education programs that are not in registered apprenticeships. Not a perfect solution. Not everyone here will agree with that. But where we are right now is apprenticeship is its path. And to the extent we're doing career training in the schools that is not apprenticeship, we will have a new skills board. So then the question is, who is the new skills board? How do you appoint it? What is the power flow? This is all about power and money, as you may or may not be aware. Um, so what was originally proposed by the legislative staff was that there should be, the board should be private sector people uh, appointed by the governor and the speaker of the house and the president of the senate. And that there be what they call a, a um, career and technical education sub-cabinet that would, separate from the individual skills definitions, would drive the regulations and money for expanding our current technical education across the state. Well, the traditional educators went nuts and pushed back and said, what do these employers know about work? They didn't say it exactly that way, but, uh, but that was the implication. And so uh, we ended up with a compromise. So far, we'll see if it holds. We currently have what we call the Governor's Workforce Investment Board, which is sort of a policy advisor. 50 members made up largely of employers, but includes the major educators, to advise the governor and the legislature on workforce strategy. So the compromise at this point is that that group will create a committee of itself, of course, and that will be the regulatory agency and the funding agency for um, growing um, our workforce education, including apprenticeships, with this carve out on the skill standards that if it is a registered apprenticeship, that will go through the apprenticeship system and not the other way around. So as you can tell, we have it all figured out. It's all under control in Maryland. And uh, I look forward to learning from you all today. Thanks very, very much. Great to be with you. Good uh, morning, everybody, and uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, the Senate and, and, and uh, the Urban Institute for hosting uh, myself and the delegation from NOCN. And uh, I'm going to take you through um, the architecture of the English apprenticeships uh, model as it currently is, um, following the reforms um, that were implemented in 2017, and particularly the concept of endpoint assessment for, uh, for this, uh, th this way of doing things. So, my name's Thomas Burton, I'm the Head of Assessment at NOCM, and I'm going to take you through just a little bit of a background into our organisation to start with, and then take you through some steps. So, we're an established um, English awarding organisation uh, historically, been around for around 30 years, um, with an educational charity and not-for-profit focus, with the, the heart of the apprentice or the learner um, at the, the centre of what we do, making sure that both the productivity question and the social mobility question of career progression and development is at the uh, point of what we do. We're an educational charity that's approved uh, by the UK government to deliver endpoint assessment. 
and we work on a global field uh, as well as the UK in sectors such as financial services, construction and engineering and we've been an early adapter of those English apprenticeship reforms both with qualification development and endpoint assessment development. So the current scene and the current stakeholders uh, for the apprenticeship model in the, in the UK as it stands uh, has four stakeholders. Centrally at that is the English apprentice. But feeding into that apprentice is the employer, the training provider, uh, and the endpoint assessment organisation. And they are key, really, because without a partnership approach and without in, um, ensuring all stakeholders work together and all stakeholders have a, a, an interest in that apprentice, the, sift, the system can often become quite difficult. We see different models in, di in different organisations. Sometimes it's employer-led, sometimes uh, the train provider might be a, a, a college or a community college, as Tom's been explaining. Um, and sometimes the employer does the train, sometimes the, the, uh, the train provider does the train. But they're all focused centrally on the end product, as I like to call it, of that apprentice. What does that end product look like for that particular employer? And then the next level down is the key components of what we have in the, in the system. We have the standard, the apprenticeship standard, so what we like to sort of refer to as the job description for that apprentice. What does that, that, that industry, what does that um, occupational look like to this, um, this apprentice? It includes things like knowledge, skills and behaviours that is expected to be uh, demonstrated. It also has a focus on soft skill development. So how is that uh, apprentice behaving in the, in the workplace and how are they interacting with their colleagues, both internal and external? We have a curriculum and program content, so ensuring that content is delivered that's specific to a, a sector or specific to an industry, but also specific to an employer that's requesting that, that training of the apprentice. We have on-the-job mentoring and, and, and development of that person. So often you see apprentices buddying up with, uh, with colleagues uh, in that industry, making sure that the, a point of contact for the training uh, provided to make sure that the apprentice is performing as expected and developing those correct competences. And at the end then we've got endpoint assessment delivery or assessment delivery in some, some aspects, as, uh, aspects where it's 100% independent of that training provider. So as Sir Jerry said on, our, on the Institute for Apprenticeships video, that, uh, that training provider is no longer marking their own work, no longer putting uh, apprentices through without some, uh, some focus on that, their competences. And we're using robust assessment methods, often up-to-date, often virtual, and we're using competent, up-to-date, industry-recognised assessors to do that. So some of the key steps that I'll try and highlight in yellow. It's the, it's the focus of the employer and the training provider just to ask what standard and what industry that, that they go into, and making sure that that industry and that standard aligns to that employer. The apprentice has to uh, complete what we call prerequisites before assessment in, the, in our country, ensuring that they have a minimum level of maths and English that's equivalent to uh, a high school diploma in the US before they can complete their apprenticeships. Often the uh, specific elements of endpoint assessment that they must complete, portfolios of work, competency statements, witness developments, um, and often practical um, skill tests. Endpoint assessment is completed by an independent body, and OCN as uh, one of them, but there's 150 others in the, in the sector. And it's independent and robust, and often done in a window of assessment. So it's not elongated over a number of years. It's very focused to sign off that apprentice in terms of their level of competence. And then the certificate is issued by the uh, Department for Education, particularly the Education Skills Funding Agency, um, which is a national recognised certificate across all apprentices in, the UK, uh, in, in England, um, which highlights the level of achievement they've got. So it's also graded either pass, uh, maybe a merit, or the top 10% candidates at a distinction level. So recognition of just at the level of that apprentice and how they're performing. So what is endpoint assessment and why are some key things? Well, it independently confirms that that apprentice is, is competent against a recognised level of industry standard. It's been designed by the employers themselves, so they have picked the methods of assessment that they would like us to use with that apprentice and making sure that that apprentice achieves a high standard through their assessment. 
It's also addressed a question about the apprenticeship brand and how robust is that apprenticeship brand when it comes to signing competence off and the end product of the apprentice. But it really, the, the key to it is that it requires up-to-date competent assessors that are qualified in assessment practice to go out and do these assessments. So we are not just simply passing apprentices without some, um, some rigour. What it also tests and what is key for me is that the training and educational development of that apprentice has been done to a high standard. So apprentices uh, can fail in this process. They cannot achieve if their competence and their skill and their knowledge isn't there. And fundamentally that's what endpoint assessment tests. Is that apprentice competent within that industry to stand up as a, as a regular member of, of the company's employment? So these are just some of our partners in the, in the UK. Uh, some you may recognise from work that's, that's conducted in, uh, in, uh, in the US. We've got people like Barclays and HSBC and uh, Canada Life in the financial services sector, as well as uh, the French energy company EDF, um, BP Chemicals, um, who had a bit of an issue in, in the Gulf once upon a time in America, I do remember, um, a steel manufacturer, um, and then petroleum and gas companies such as Total. Um, and these partnerships are really key to ensuring success within um, both on programme delivery and training, but also the endpoint assessment piece. And I'm going to focus on two of our, of our case studies um, and, and highlight some of the, the key elements to some of these. So the first one is with uh, Barclays, and we've delivered and, and completed endpoint assessment with this organisation from what the UK. Uh, has at level two, which is equivalent of a, uh, the high school diploma level in the US, all the way through to um, degree level at what we refer to as level six. So the full spectrum of, of almost educational programs in that sector. We completed the first English endpoint assessment with Barclays in the financial services sector. So the very first apprentice was a young man called Mark Curran. Uh, he was top of his class, uh, been striving for his apprenticeship uh, for, for almost two years and he was the very first financial services English apprentice to go through EPA. Um, and, he, and he passed. Um, what that has then meant is that the um, Barclays have expen uh, expanded and developed um, their own internal uh, development. So they became their, what's called an employee provider and now deliver their training in-house using their members of staff and specialists from the education se uh, sector. And I mentioned that, that partnerships are key in this process. So they use an, an organisation called the London Institute of Banking and Finance to live the more intricate compliance and risk um, elements of uh, financial services work, ensuring that it's robust uh, delivery of education and specific topis, uh, topics that are regulated quite heavily in the, in the UK. My second case study refers to BP Chemicals um, in the petroleum and gas sector. Uh, we work with an employer that um, operates on the largest UK um, natural gas terminals and oil terminals um, on the Humber, um, which is uh, on the east coast of England. And they put their apprentice, uh, apprenticeships through uh, a three-year technical um, programme, including safety and, and, and engineering technical qualifications. And this has been a real interesting one, completely different from the financial services sector, where you, you are on an oil terminal um, out on, on, you know, in, the, in the North Sea, uh, close to the UK, uh, and apprentices are working in a real high-risk environment. Uh, you know, there's thousands and thousands of gallons of, of petroleum that pass through this terminal on a daily basis, and these apprentices have to be safe, first and foremost. So there's a lot of e uh, emphasis in, in these particular um, apprenticeships about working safely and operating safely in this organisation. And what's been key is that, as well as BP uh, Chemicals um, out uh, this uh, terminal, is there's other uh, employers that are keen on having safe, high-quality apprenticeships, such as the French petroleum producer Total uh, and, um, and Exxon Mobile, um, or, or mobile, uh, mo mobile One, as they call it, in, in, uh, in, in, the, in Europe. And, and all three of these um, employers have come together to work through what apprentices, apprenticeships look like for this particular oil, oil terminal. So they've set up their own training school out, uh, out on the east coast of England. And that's really a, a good example of how more than one employer can come together and develop a standard uh, for that industry in that particular geographical area, similar to what the, um, my, my, the previous speaker was saying. 
And these partnerships and case studies are, 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 are starting to bear fruit and, and give us success. And what we're seeing is that where focus has been, de uh, uh, has been aimed and, 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 uh, um, and particular standards and particular um, industries have worked together collaboratively, the quality of the apprenticeship uh, starts to shine through and we get a higher pass rate, a higher distinction rate, um, which thus the end product becomes a higher, a higher calibre. Thank you very much, and I'm on a panel later on in the uh, in the session, so I'll be welcoming any questions then. Thank you very much. Okay, wonderful. So thank you everybody for coming and we've got the first panel um, which is about what do we mean um, by quality in the apprenticeship context. Uh, my name is Susanna Lawson, I have the honour of uh, chairing this panel. I'm the CEO and co-founder of OneFile, we're an edtech company based in Manchester. Bob just asked me to give you a brief info about what OneFile does. So I've been involved in vocational training and apprenticeships for 19 years now. Um, and when I was uh, doing vocational training as a student myself, I became an assessor, a manager. I saw huge inefficiencies um, financially and in quality of doing it on paper. Um, so um, with my partner, we designed a cloud-based system so the competences can be placed online, people can gather evidence, upload it, and it means that everybody has access to it. So the audits can happen, the apprentice has access, um, standardization can occur. So that's where I'm coming from, so that's why I've been asked to lead this uh, panel today. So um, just for a reminder for those online, if you can send your emails in to events at urban.org if you have any questions, and they can be raised at the end for you as well. So. To introduce the panel, to my left we have Simon Ashworth, he's the Chief Policy Officer for the Association of Employment and Learning Providers in the UK. We then have Marty Le Leathers, the Director of Missouri uh, Division of Workforce Development. We have Sarah Waltz, uh, Reinard, the CEO of Polytechnics Canada and former head of the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum. And finally, we have John Ladd, uh, the Administrator for the um, Office of Apprenticeships, the US Department of Labor. So we have a very wide range, three countries, um, all giving their opinions and their perspectives about quality in apprenticeships. So if we can make a start, the first question I'm going to ask today is about the standardization of um, frameworks or occupational pathways. So um, I think what would be great is to get a little discussion going on how the different countries view that, the importance of that, and how they do that in their own countries or state, as it may be. So uh, Simon, would you like to start about the UK model? Yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, we've got a really interesting model in the UK. We're actually uh, transitioning. So we, um, we had a, uh, a legacy system around apprenticeship frameworks, which are quite um, broad set of uh, qualification-led programs and we're actually moving to a, a model around uh, apprenticeship standards and I think as, uh, as Jerry mentioned uh, we've got about 300, 350 apprenticeship standards uh, very much more specific to uh, occupational job roles um, and we'll probably end up uh, with a system by 2020 of probably around uh, 500 apprenticeship standards. So at the moment we're going through very much a, a transition uh, from sort of a, a broad brace, a broad brace of uh, qualification-led programmes to the new apprenticeship standards. And um, 
Just want to talk about the apprenticeship standards in a bit more detail. So as, as Tom mentioned, uh, that's overseen by the Institute for Apprenticeships, but it's not actually the Institute who developed the, the actual uh, apprenticeship standards. They're developed by employers. So trailblazer employers come together in an occupational area to uh, develop the standard. Uh, but employers uh, don't just do that alone. Uh, they're supported by um, independent training providers or uh, workforce intermediaries, as I think you call them over here, um, and also assessment organisations. So it, really the development of apprenticeships is a collaboration between uh, employers, uh, training providers, uh, and assessment organisations, which are overseen uh, by the Institute for Apprenticeships. Okay. John, do you want to give the American view? Sure, sure. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thanks to Bob and Tom for organizing this great event. Um, I, I guess transition is, the, is a good word for us as well. We're, we're definitely in the midst of a transition here, uh, certainly from uh, the system you heard this morning of registered apprenticeship and the standards that are developed there. And we're really kind of right midstream in trying to stand up an additional option, additional um, pathway for employers, which we're calling industry recognized apprenticeship, uh, which is similar to some of the things you're hearing from the UK and other places. Um, I would say historically, we have struggled uh, with the standardization of uh, training broadly uh, and as well in the apprenticeship space in terms of how we define those standards. I think we're a little reluctant to overly standardize uh, the, the training requirements for any specific occupation or job here in the US. Uh, so that's always been a challenge for us in terms of we really don't have the infrastructure, we really don't have the approved bodies that can do that kind of work and can speak in a broad way and, and it's one of the reasons we look to the UK because we're very interested in that trailblazer model in terms of a voluntary approach of employers coming together. Um, historically what we've done is we've used what we call the uh, an apprenticeability process on the front end to kind of categorize the work and set the, the broad standard for occupational training, you know, how many hours, what the work process schedule looks like, and those kind of things. But there's a lot of flexibility within that, that framework. Uh, more recently, we're working with Bob and his team to really move towards a competency-based model. We think there's a lot less debate and a lot less, uh, there's room for more consensus when you really focus on competency. So working with Bob and his team, we've developed about 20, 25 now, trying to get up to about 40 to 50 by the end of the year. Uh, again, using this consensus-based model, bringing employers together, together to develop competency-based standards that still allow for customization. We're always going to require some level of customization at that employer level. Um, but we certainly want to think about how we could move to that competency model. Also in this new option of industry recognized apprenticeship, we're also going to be leveraging um, existing credentials more. Right? Th those are our frameworks and training requirements are already fairly well established um, by those particular industries. So we're going to see how we could leverage um, the issuance of these industry-based credentials as uh, kind of a proxy for the broad occupational frameworks. Great. And Marty, do you want to give your perspective from a specific state of Missouri? Yeah, so in the United States, um, really there's, there's two sides. There's those states that have their own apprenticeship councils and their own um, policies, and then there's um, the other 25 states, which Missouri is one of, where we just follow the federal guidelines. And so we work with the Office of Administration, uh, or Office of Apprenticeship rather, uh, to uh, set up all the administrative components of our apprenticeship program. So when we work with um, looking at the standards, we, we really look at the, the large database that they have. We work with their team, the, the, the uh, federal staff that's uh, in our state, and we look at um, kind of those incumbent models and then we customize them and tweak them and then have a lot of flexibility, as, as, as John said, uh, with, with not just the, um, you know, the, the work requirements, but also uh, with the uh, related training and instruction. So for us, um, it's that balance of um, really pushing innovation and trying to uh, create new things, but without um, pushing the, you know, the, the, the concept of quality so far that we don't have a mechanism in which to maintain that. And so for us, where we kind of stay on that razor's edge is working with the existing standards that have been in play and trying to kind of uh, uh, broaden those as much as possible to be 
customized. So, uh, but we, we, you know, we see a lot of opportunity to, to continue to push that. Um, for us in Missouri, it's, um, we have a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, we, we've are, we're interested in the IRAP model and what that might mean um, for, for the programs in our states, especially as we move into uh, sectors of what we call non-traditional apprenticeships, which are, you know, still supporting the skilled trades and allowing those to flourish, but, but expanding and innovating into these other non-traditional sectors like finance, healthcare, and IT. Okay, great. And Sarah, what about the perspective in Canada? Uh, good morning and uh, thanks for having me. Um, the, uh, the Canadian system is uh, interesting. There are about 400 occupations that we consider to be apprenticeable. Um, but uh, that is it's regulated at the provincial level. So we have 13 um, provinces and territories. Each are the regulators of, uh, of apprenticeship. And, uh, and each of them are using a slightly different way to develop their um, frameworks, but largely using employers. Employers are a big, um, a big part of the process. Uh, we're in four sectors, um, so construction, uh, industrial, motive power, and service sectors. Uh, and then across the country, those, um, those regulatory bodies uh, get together at a, at a national level and uh, have come together to recognize 56 trades that are common across the country. And we call those uh, the Red Seal trades. Um, Red Seal trades are, uh, they have a slightly different process when it comes to developing the occupational uh, frameworks. They, they take what's been done in each of the provinces and territories each of, the, um, each of the regulators identify not only employers, but also apprentices and, uh, and training providers and come together every five years to review the occupational framework. Uh, so they spend a, they spend a week together uh, in a room hashing out what are the tasks and the subtasks and the competencies and the skills uh, that are required from day one on the job to uh, through to in general, uh, four years. They're talking about uh, an average of about 7,200 hours um, to be competent across the majority of those trades, and uh, and start really going through um, going through those line by line, uh, and then based on that, the regulators get back together and they say, if we were going to test this, we were going to test these skills. Um, how would we do that? What questions would we ask? Uh, and they, they put together uh, multiple choice exams in each of those uh, 56 uh, trades. And after uh, somebody has uh, done their 7,200 hours, uh, which includes about 80% on the job, 20% uh, in, uh, in a, with a technical trainer in a, in a college um, for the most part, they, uh, they, write, they, write this, um, they write this exam based on skills questions are not they're less knowledge based and more skills based uh, questions but they are but they are multiple choice and uh, you get 70 percent um, on that exam and and you know you're a qualified uh, journey person but i think that uh, when we when we talk about you know that process to put together the occupational frameworks certainly um, based on uh, employer requirements uh, but common requirements across across the country um, so we really think about that framework as being the, uh, the sort of the baseline of uh, common core elements uh, in the trades. You often will get some, you know, crazy thing that a province will not let come out of that competency profile, even though it's unique to their environment. Um, but for the most part, they're supposed to be around common core, and they're only really seen as a starting point. So, you know, recognize that if somebody was finishing a university degree or a college diploma, it would still only be the foundation of what they're going to learn throughout their, um, throughout their career. And, uh, and so that's sort of, the, sort of the baseline. And then from there, um, once somebody's got their, their journey person certification, um, they're, they're always learning. So it's, um, there's, there's certainly a standardization that happens across the country, although with 80% of the training happening in the workplace, that's not the part that is uh, heavily regulated. You know, there's heavy regulation around the technical training components, but the, um, 
but what happens with an employer is um, is the day to day. You know, it's it's the stuff that makes sense for that employer in that part of the country, um, in that particular sector of the economy. Recognizing that you know something like an occupation like an electrician or a welder uh, crosses boundaries between construction and industrial. Uh, and in some cases right through to, uh, to the motive power sector. So it doesn't make sense to expect them all to know everything that is unique to an employer. Uh, so there's a lot of flexibility, but it happens in the employer training component. Okay, that's really interesting, Sarah. So my next question was actually about employers, and you all mentioned the importance of employers and their um, input into the um, occupational standards, and that from one employer to another, um, there will be individual requirements for the training. But how much should the employers be able to change that national occupational standard? Um, Marty, do you want to leave? Yeah, so we really want a lot of flexibility. Um, for us, it's working with our employers uh, to understand the change in needs um, of talent for them. And so part of that is as is, is the workplace changes and we help uh, you know, align our strategies to increase the productivity of our workforce. We want to make sure um, the structured on the job training and the related uh, training and instruction that's occurring is, is, is something that isn't uh, necessarily canned, but it can be flexible enough to help um, and be dynamic enough to help um, these businesses with today's and tomorrow's challenges, and not just yesterday's challenges. And so, so again, I mentioned that you know we, we like to use existing standards as a guidepost, but then push them out as far as we can and make them customizable to the point of where we're not breaking the standard or we're not diluting the quality, but yet we are allowing our employers to be flexible because it's you know we, we truly believe in Missouri. It's, it needs to be employer driven and employer choice. So we want to sit down with employers and really design customized programs that fit their needs. Uh, but they can be flexible um, so that over, over time they can also change. So as they uh, you know, uh, use, uh, increase use of technology and they automate and, and, and um, their workforce shifts, then you know, uh, the programs can shift along with them and to do that. So for us, um, flexibility for employers is extremely important. And I think that that is a separate question or separate discussion than quality because you can still maintain quality and have flexibility. Um, you know, I, I think where, where you get yourself into trouble sometimes is, is you know, when, when we have the conversation with employers of, okay, we want to be, we want to customize this, we want to be flexible, we want to make this your program, but you're not going to get an eight-week apprenticeship. But you're not, so, I mean, you just have to set those parameters and say, listen, this is what an apprenticeship is, this is what it is not. And, 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 and most of the time, they understand that. Once you set the parameters and then you work with them to kind of build it inside that shell, you see a lot of opportunity. And so for us, that's how we feel. Um, you know, we, we stay within um, the certain boundaries, but, but we push out as far as we can for customization. Okay, Simon from the UK. I think it's, uh, it's a really interesting kind of topic because in the UK, we've probably gone from quite a, um, uh, a, a broad approach around some of the apprenticeship frameworks to be very much more specific to um, occupational job roles. So I'd say the actual flexibility that we've had with employers is probably compacted. Um, so the idea is that the apprenticeship standards, uh, people who are trained in an apprenticeship standard, that they, they have a, a degree of portability. So if you move from one business to another, you have a, a kind of core, core set. I think um, you know, what, one of the key things for the Institute of Apprenticeships is when they uh, work with employers to develop a, a standard, they have a, a broad range of employers who develop that standard, so it's not too weighted to one organisation, but um, uh, the, the key for our system really is employers and uh, having an employer-led system. So yeah, absolutely, you've got the kind of core uh, skills, knowledge and behaviours for that job role, but um, you can still absolutely, and, uh, and our best um, providers provide a, a contextualised and a, a customised programme uh, to meet the needs of employers. And they're the ones who are most successful because they have a kind of core product and they'll bolt on and build that specifically for the employer. But uh, like I say, our, our apprenticeship standards are a lot more uh, a lot more specific than the apprenticeship frameworks. I think w one of the kind of criticisms of the old system was that someone might do an apprenticeship framework and get uh, some very broad skills uh, and they move to a similar organisation and actually they wouldn't have the, the transferability in some of those skills and so actually they need to do a, uh, another apprenticeship and it, in, our, in our system it's um, very heavily subsidised by government. So the argument is, what you know, are we paying twice for the same thing? So it's get, getting a balance really about not, not being too specific and allowing employees that kind of customisation. 
John, so I'm just picking up on what Simon said. Mm -hmm. So if somebody does has done an apprenticeship with one employer mm -hmm. and then they leave and go to another employer within a state or between states, yeah. how important is it that employers understand what level of competency that person has? Sure. No, I think that's extremely important. And uh, I, you know, I think this idea of national portability, the idea of occupational proficiency has always kind of been a theme within the apprenticeship system. But I, but I do think now we are looking for additional flexibility. So, so I think it depends on what, what the ultimate goal of the training is. Right, so typically we've talked about apprenticeship as preparing someone for occupational proficiency, to be fully proficient in that occupation, but then what defines an occupation? Is it all, all elements of the job? Do we want someone to be fully trained and well-rounded in every aspect of that occupation? Or you know, are, are the job tasks and functions that, that someone might need to know a lot narrower? So this is again something that we think with this new option that we're bringing on of industry recognized apprenticeship, it gives employers another level where they can, they can even think about stackable credentials, a, a little bit more of a transparent system to say we can design an apprenticeship around this credential that could lead to another credential where before we really didn't have that flexibility. We, we were, were training at, at to this very high standard. We allowed kind of an 80-20 degree of flexibility between for the individual employer to ensure that national portability but for a lot of employers we're hearing look we, we we're not we don't have the ability to train someone at this level but we could train someone at this level and so you know I do think that we're in this moment here where we're trying to provide additional flexibility and create uh, a system of more stackable credentials that could lead to that Great. Yeah. And Sarah, in Canada, how would that work? Because obviously, again, in a huge country, how would that work? You know, I think John brings up a really, a really good point about not all employers have, um, have the capacity to train to, uh, to uh, maybe a full credential. And you know, Canada is a country of small and medium-sized businesses. So I mean, we're really talking about 90% of businesses have fewer than 100 employees. Um, many don't have um, dedicated human resources folks on site. Um, and so, you know, their ability to train somebody to to a full credential um, is it can be a real challenge, which is I think uh, one of the reasons. Um, for thinking about those kind of common core elements and, and that's what an apprenticeship is. Um, each uh, apprentice is provided with a logbook, so it suggests which competencies and what skills it is a, a, an apprentice should be developing in uh, their first level or their second level or their third level, recognizing that they probably aren't going to get every skill, every experience uh, with every employer. Um, but you'd like to keep an apprentice employed from, from the first day they walk onto the job to certification. Uh, and, uh, and ideally, we know that's when apprentices really succeed. That's when they are better able to complete, better able to get to certification if they've got that, uh, that consistency. Uh, so I think that the logbook does provide, um, from an employer perspective, some guidance. Here are some things that we, you know, we want the apprentices to learn. There's a, a bit of an opportunity to be able to say there are some things here I can't teach. Uh, those become things that we can take care of maybe in the technical training that's happening at, uh, at the, uh, the college level. Um, so there's some pa place to do that there. If we think about sectors, and more and more the conversation we've been getting into is around consortia. How do you get small businesses uh, within a, a geographic region to cooperate with each other to give all of the skills to, to an apprentice through the, course of their, uh, through the course of their career? And I think that that is going to be, um, I think that's going to be sort of the next phase um, when we start talking about uh, full competency development. It's not a matter of there's no flexibility for employers. Employers are going to teach what they what they're working on and they want the apprentice to know their their systems and their technology and their clients and their environment. Uh, but we still need to be making an effort toward portability and uh, recognizing small businesses are also the businesses least likely to uh, 
to be you know long long term too so they, they it is important for an individual once they've started to have that ability to take what they've learned and move it into uh, move it into another workplace um, so that logbook allows them it's that's a little bit of a portability record of the skills they've learned they can take it into their technical training and say it looks like I'm missing some of these things. Uh, do I have a bit of an opportunity to do that? And then maybe have some employers cooperating with each other to say, I don't have the ability to teach that particular skill. You know, if it's for a, a baker, we never bake bread. So we're not going to be able to teach that. Uh, but is there a bakery down the street where they can do a little bit of a trade and uh, try and give, try and give uh, those apprentices the full scope of uh, the training and I think that's where some of the flexibility is built in. Right, thank you. Um, everybody talks about funding for apprenticeships, whether it comes from the government, whether it comes from the employer, whether it comes from, in some situations, the apprentice themselves. How can we maintain that high level of quality but make it cost effective for the employer or the intermediary, the training provider, the college that's delivering that? Simon. Again, that's a, n another really interesting question. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, in, in England, we're, we're, we're very fortunate. We have the apprenticeship levy. Um, so I think, as, as Tom alluded to, that's a, a tax on large businesses. So that's about 2% of employers in, in England pla uh, pay the apprenticeship levy. Um, and that generates around sort of $3 billion into the system, which um, helps uh, the government subsidise the funding to uh, the 98 percent of employers in the country who uh, uh, are small SMEs. Um, I suppose it's, it, it's getting a balance really. Um, so I mean we've got some of our apprenticeships which probably have funded around $2,000 uh, for a 12-month program all the way up to apprenticeships which are funded at uh, probably around um, $35,000 over a three-year program. Uh, but they've all got common components so they've got to last at least a year, they've got to have at least uh, twenty percent off the job training time, so I suppose there's a balance really between uh, making it attractive to uh, providers to be able to deliver, uh, looking at return on investment for for employers. Um, government uh, is really supportive of that. They, you know, they say that every pound or every dollar, I suppose, they they invested in, in apprenticeships returns uh, thirty dollars. Um, and again, we we have similar challenges in England uh, as you do here around. Uh, um, relatively low levels of unemployment and lots of uh, job, job, uh, job openings and it's kind of getting that balance uh, uh, and using apprenticeships. But, uh, so I suppose it's, uh, yeah, some of it is around looking at um, return on investment, um, filling the skills gaps, um, filling the recruitment needs. Um, again, in the UK our, our, our workforce intermediaries um, help employees with the recruitment. So it's not necessarily just about the training, it's about the whole end-to-end -end package, about um, getting a vacancy, advertising, filling the vacancy, uh, providing the training, providing the progression. So it really is a sort of a, a, a service offer uh, a, a, along with the return on investment. But uh, yeah, it's interesting, in the UK we obviously, um, it is heavily subsidised by government and that brings with it uh, a whole book of rules and regulation uh, which require um, which helps, some of it helps drive the quality and some of it drives the, the perverse behaviour. So I suppose if I was looking for, for a, an ideal world, it would probably have less of the rules and regulation. Um, but yeah, with, with the money comes the, the, the requirements as well. So following on from that, Marty, with the accountability for the quality, who should that lie with? Right, so I think for us, um, we're trying to figure that question out. Um, I, you know, to, to say I know the answer would just... Uh, would be would be unfair. I, you know, we're, we're, I know we're working with the um, Department of Labor for guidance uh, on, on these things. We we have a great uh, team um, through the Office of Apprenticeships uh, in Missouri that we work with with our state director and, and their staff. Um, but you know, to, on the accountability piece, what we do, if, if I can kind of take it back a second, on how we're investing and what we're doing to to kind of monitor the performance. You know, so we're looking at really three levers of performance. Um, in Missouri, we really want to. Um, we want to positively influence workforce productivity. And so we think the way that that can happen is um, one looking at, you know, how many people, um, so if we're leveraging education dollars as well as our public workforce system dollars, so Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act money, some Wagner Pizer opportunities, things like that, vocational rehabilitation, um, you know, some of the, the different title partners under WIOA. We're putting some of that money in, and what that money's doing 
Um, and we've put about $7 million into that. Part of it came from, um, we leveraged some of the money from uh, our, uh, through some grants that we got from, from mm -hmm. DOL to expand and, and apprenticeship USA and et cetera. But also we took about $4 million out of our uh, governor's 50% fund, which for the uh, colleagues here in the United States, that's the 15% uh, governor's discretionary fund that comes out of the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. And so what we've done with that is we've offset the cost for the related training and instruction, uh, as well as some of the intermediary cost. But the employer still bears the cost of, of course, hiring the apprentice, paying for the apprentice, um, and then also paying for um, management of that apprentice for the on-the-job training piece. And so, what, so, I, so I say that to say, if you look at the dollars that we're investing and how we're trying to understand our return, you know, uh, what's the retention rate of these apprentices? What's the educational attainment rate? And really we look at the milestones, the stackable of credentials that they get along the way. So yes, if it's a two-year apprenticeship program, we, we certainly want to measure the end goal, the full completion, but we care a lot about that uh, credential that you get at six months or at uh, you know, uh, nine months down the road, and, and, and we want to give credit for that. And then we look at uh, the measurable wage gains. And so through our apprenticeship models, are we positively influencing wages? So measurable skills gains, wage gains, that helps drive uh, performance and, and productivity in Missouri. And for us, that's one way we're trying to uh, tie accountability to the dollars that we're spending. But um, the bigger question of how do we keep a, a, a more broad accountability to the quality of the programs, I think we're still learning uh, mm -hmm. how we might do that. Okay. And Sarah, how does the accountability work in Canada? You know, it, because the we really have 13 apprenticeship systems across the country. So, you know, each province and territory regulates their own. They, they have their own way of thinking about, uh, you know, what that funding uh, model looks like and where the... Um, and where that differs um, in terms of uh, the degree to which government is funding versus uh, the private sector. The, when, you know, I'd say in general, um, you know, what happens is uh, an apprentice comes onto the job site, they are paid probably 50% um, of the wage of the, of the journey person um, within any given employer. And then as they progress, they, there's an expectation that after you finished your first level, you know, your, your wage goes up. So now you're making 60 or 65%. And that continues to increase uh, through the course of your apprenticeship, which means that employers are paying less for um, apprentices that, are, that don't have a lot of experience in the workplace. But when it comes to the technical training, largely that's being paid by the, um, the regulatory authority. So they're paying for their seats in, uh, in the technical training. To some degree, apprentices um, may be putting um, money on the table for that in the form of tuition or, or books. Lots of times that is completely covered by government. And because they're taking a break from their employment, uh, they can go on employment insurance. So they can get 55% of their wages um, covered through the federal um, employment insurance system. And then their employer has the option of topping them up to 95% of their regular um, weekly wages. Uh, so in, in this way, you know, there's, um, there's some shared responsibility around, uh, around how apprenticeship is funded. Uh, but, uh, but when it comes to you know, accountability around the, uh, around the quality or around the, uh, around the funding model, it really comes back down to uh, is this apprentice somebody that is, is committed to their own training? Uh, it will keep their job because they're an employee. They're not, uh, they're not protected as a learner. Um, they are a registered apprentice, means that you have an employer who's agreed to hire you and you have to show up every day and do that work and you know commit to your own learning uh, and then you've got to be the one who says I'm gonna take a break and I'm gonna go back to school uh, in uh, in collaboration with with your employer so I think that a lot of the progression piece the accountability for that is on the apprentice and then the rest of the apprenticeship community is is sort of the support structure to, to help them to help them do that Okay, great. So we've got about five minutes before we go into Q&A. Can I just add, add a, a oh, point yes, on that? Because I, I think it's important to point out in the U.S., you know, I, again, this has been a fundamental transition in um, the landscape of apprenticeship in the United States. I mean, I was looking at the slide earlier with that rich, you know, ecosystem of players and different roles. And if you went back 10 years and looked at the U.S. system, there'd probably be two entities on, on a similar chart, right? It would be 
our small office at the federal government or a state office would have responsibility for promotion, oversight, uh, evaluation, and the employers were doing everything else, right? So it was a very small ecosystem and not much support. Um, about five years ago, we started putting funding into the system. We're seeing this tremendous growth in, in apprenticeship and explosion of interest. And there's just no way, we're, we're a self-limiting factor on how much the system can grow. So you know, we really try to promote more intermediaries coming into this, into this space. Um, but we're about to launch an effort to really delegate that responsibility to these third party certifiers and accrediting bodies to say, you all know your industry, you all can be, be the, the assurers of quality for that particular industry, help grow apprenticeship in your particular industry. So this is a fundamental change that's happening here in the United States and it's really driven by this, this demand and interest and, and the funding that's been provided. I mean, again, 10 years ago, zero federal funding for apprenticeship. Today and you know, over the next couple of years, we could have close to a billion dollars of funding to support apprenticeship. So a dramatically new landscape with many more players. I don't know if we'll ever get to where uh, the UK is in terms of really a rich ecosystem of people playing very specific roles, but it'll certainly be more than the two <laughs> that existed you know, as little as 10 years ago. That's fantastic. So we've got a few minutes before we go to Q&A. So if I could just ask you all to come up with two thoughts about quality. One, what is the one thing that's working really well for quality? And one, what is the biggest challenge you see facing achieving that quality? Simon, do you want to go first on the spot? On the spot. So <laughs> what's working well in terms of quality? I think we've got a, um, a really good um, regulatory system around the actual apprenticeship training. So you probably saw earlier the mentioning of uh, Ofsted, which is um, uh, the regulatory body that uh, goes out and uh, independently inspects um, private providers, colleges, uh, and, and that's a very powerful organisation. So they have a grading system. If you get uh, a, a poor grade, a grade four, you're, you're struck off the apprenticeship register and you can't deliver. So in, in terms of the actual um, training for the OM programme, we have a, a, a recognised and established um, kind of government agency that, that looks after that. In terms of probably what, what, what doesn't work so well around the quality is um, uh, I think independent endpoint assessment is, is, a, is a brilliant opportunity, you know, um, being able to uh, independently uh, check and verify learners' competence. I still think that's a very new system um, and the, the whole quality assurance of endpoint assessment uh, is probably untried and untested and I think there's lots of different organisations involved in that, whereas on the, the on program training we've got one organization it's very kind of clear at the moment we, we potentially got kind of 20 to 30 organizations who look after quality assurance I think the uh, that's probably a, a, an unanswered question and probably the, the 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 biggest challenge for us is making sure we've got a kind of quality and robustness around the 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 EQA which is uh, sorry the endpoint assessment which is going to be a really important part of the new standards okay Marty you know I think for us um, it's a couple of things one um, you know, we're still trying to figure out how do we scale uh, these models and how do we innovate. I mean, for us, it's still 20 apprentices here, 30 apprentices here, and you know, we need to get to hundreds of apprentices here and a thousand apprentices here. And, and you know, how do we scale it as well as then how do we, as we scale it, how do we address quality? And I, I, we don't have the answer yet. I think that's what we're still trying to learn, especially in Missouri as a, as a state that is not a, you know, we don't have an apprenticeship council or we don't have these standards in place on our own. Um, which we, we like that design, but yet we still need to allow ourselves to be dynamic and growing. I think, I think the other side of it for us too is, um, you know, as you're working with the employers and, and we're working with our education providers, which is really what, what we kind of help facilitate uh, and try to bring to the table, um, a lot of people are getting into the, it's, it's a hot topic right now. I mean, workforce development's a hot topic right now. And so we have a lot of, um, groups who, who you know are now hanging the shingle of apprenticeship providers or or or, or workforce development providers or people in this space um, and so it, it, what's happening is is it's kind of the, there's not a clear definition of what apprenticeships are there's not a clear definition of what we mean when we say workforce development and so you kind of that runs the risk of diluting the brand and the understanding and kind of I think that also um, you know so, so as far as what's the big challenge I see how do you, how do we encourage everyone to still get out there to innovate, help us grow and expand, but 
do it in a way that is, is somewhat of a controlled environment in which that we're not um, um, you know, getting it in front of quality or out away from quality uh, and, and it being too late. You know, so one thing, the last point I'll say is just in Missouri alone, so we have 16 different state agencies uh, with uh, about, uh, uh, about $500 million uh, of federal funds that flow through us. Um, and, and so in those 16 agencies, seven of us have our own apprenticeship programs. And so in Missouri alone, we're trying to get our different state agencies to get on the same page. And, and, and that, you know, you can't imagine getting them on the, st getting us on the same page. And then also then we're working with 14 workforce boards in Missouri and all of our education providers. So it's a lot of herding of cats right now and trying to figure out what is, um, you know, uh, what is our vision and how do we connect it all together? Fantastic, Sarah. Uh, I'd say that uh, one of the things I think is uh, very high quality has, uh, has to do with the, the technical training where the majority of that is, uh, is regulated, so in terms of the curriculum and the expectations of what will happen uh, when an apprentice gets into uh, technical training, um, there, that's heavily um, dependent on what it is industry and, uh, and employers want. They're involved with program advisory committees. Uh, they're involved in, uh, in making sure that those, uh, those technical training providers have the most up-to-date equipment so that the, not only are you know, we training their own employees um, on, uh, on that equi uh, equipment with instructors who also come from industry, um, but I think, but also in terms of being able to, to cover off some of the bases that may not have happened in another workplace uh, with those apprentices. So I think that the, that system um, and the equipment that, uh, that these institutions have are uh, absolutely amazing. The, uh, and the, the quality of the instructors, the, you know, the connections with the employers, I think is, uh, is fantastic. You know, it's, in, it's an imperfect system. Um, and there are certainly there are there are weak points. You know, when I think about a multiple choice exam as being the uh, the endpoint assessment for uh, largely hands-on occupations, it doesn't. <laughs> there's a disconnect there. Um, it's uh, cheaper, um, but I'm not sure that it's uh, it's the most effective way of being able to showcase competency. So while you know, my colleagues across Canada would say, well, it's imperfect, but, you know, we're, we're making sure that the questions aren't things you could study for. You have to know what you're talking about in order to uh, do well. You know, I also recognize that apprentices have chosen the kind of um, post-secondary pathway that they have is because they, they don't like testing. Um, and they certainly would rather show you than, than write it down or choose the best of four answers. So I think that that is a, um, I think that's a weakness of the, of the, the system. We've got to get more show me kind of competency and less um, tell me, sit, sit an exam for, um, for a couple of hours and answer 100 multiple choice questions. So there's a, there's a balance there where I think that we still, we still have to figure that one out. Fabulous, John. Sure. Um, so I'd say, you know, probably building a little bit of off um, previous comments, but you know, while our system is small, you know, I do think the outcomes for the system are pretty pretty impressive. When you look at completers of an apprenticeship, earn about seventy thousand dollars a year. About ninety percent are still employed. So I think, um, you know, at this point, the the employers that are in the system are very committed to the system and generate those you know really strong outcomes the sponsors of apprenticeship programs they believe in the apprenticeship model they're not in it because we've created any perverse incentives for people to come in just to uh, you know access funding um, so you really do get this committed group of, of, of employers and sponsor groups that are committed to the model and want to make it work and you see that in the results um, you know I think some of the challenges are again you know we really do need to have a better developed system and capacity to develop these standards that can be accessed by employers and our lack of any endpoint assessment I think is a challenge for us. Okay, great. So just a reminder to the online audience to submit any questions to events at urban.org. Are there any questions in the room? There have been some questions sent. Yeah, the gentleman there, just wait for a microphone. Hi, I'm uh, Daniel Keen from the Urban Institute. Um, you, you mentioned the relationship between funding and the regulatory burden that comes and then the role that funding plays in recent expansion in the U.S., but, but you didn't say anything about funding in this tension between flexibility and standardization. And I think 
part of the reason why in the U.S. employers uh, really want flexibility is if they're paying for so much of it, you know, why shouldn't they get yep. the flexibility that they, they can get from it? So um, could you just speak, is that kind of assumption of mine right? And, and what have you learned about funding and your ability to balance uh, standardization and flexibility? Can, can I just yeah. address that? You know, I will just say that uh, while absolutely employers want flexibility, um, the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, where where is my my last uh, my last job, um, we did some extensive um, research around the return on training investment for uh, for employers. Um, spoke to over a thousand employers across sectors that were heavily engaged with uh, apprenticeship training. Uh, businesses of all sizes, it did not really matter um, which trade, what sector, what part of the country, or the size of the business. They were all getting a return on training investment. So every dollar that they spent to hire, train, waste, administration, for an apprenticeship, um, for an apprenticeship within their uh, their company, before that apprentice had even graduated, they were making a dollar forty-seven in return. So you know, I recognize that the you know the first year is uh, is a burden for apprentices. By the third or fourth year, those apprentices are providing much more in terms of value than uh, than an employer is uh, is paying them. And so while flexibility is important to kind of get them in the door, I really believe we've got to tell employers this is good for their business too. Not only good for workforce development and and making sure people are highly skilled to do the work that they need done, um, but also in terms of the benefits to their business. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm big on flexibility, but at the same time, I think that there's got to be an understanding. This is not a public good that you're doing, and there's no benefit to the business. There, there is a, a balance there. And I also think employers want ease of access and ease of ability to implement, and, and I think that's again where the role of intermediaries can come in here. I, we hear more from employers that don't want to spend a year or two standing something up. Customize. If you can offer them something that's high quality, ready to go, and in a lot of cases, sometimes they'll, they'll pay for that service. But if it's if it's something that they can build and implement quickly and put in place, that's a that's a real value to them and. You know, gets them over that hump. I mean, we still have a lot of, of lack of knowledge about how to do apprenticeship. You, you can sell them on the apprenticeship idea, but then it's still a bit of a dark road in terms of how do I get there, how do I start? And so having these intermediaries who can come in, give them plug and play options that they can customize, really is, is an incredible value that I think you know, some of the public funding can go to help to support. Great, we do have an, a question that's been emailed in. So many of the occupations that have apprenticeship programs, new and traditional, are likely to be deeply impacted by technologi technological change in the coming years. How are the quality standards encouraging the development of cognitive and conceptual skills that allow them to keep up with the technological change beyond the specific skills needed right now? A great question. question. Anybody wants to take that one? <laughs> So I'll make a start on that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free to jump in, but uh, I mean, w with our with our um, our apprenticeship standards, uh, they are ta time bound. So they um, government have made a commitment that they're updated every every three years to make sure that they they fit with with industry. Um, uh, digital and IT is a really good example of um, you know the pace of change and the pace of technology, but. Um, in the UK, we, you know, we had a very traditional model, paper-based portfolios and chalk and talk, but uh, our most sort of innovative uh, training providers, they're, they're absolutely use technology, virtual teaching, virtual resources. Uh, some of the organisations that have come with us on this trip, you know, they provide that. So, you know, technology has played a really important part and, um, you know, some of our providers, you know, to us, the UK is quite a big place. Um, for you guys, it's probably quite small, but, you know, the logistics of having to get somebody to go and see a learner uh, in one part of the country, you know, technology has been really important for us around uh, the, the expansion. And that's not necessarily just the uh, on-program training, but also for the endpoint assessment, using technology has been re really key uh, to kind of make the reforms and make the expansion kind of work. Okay, anybody? Yeah, just similarly, I mean, this is where we're relying on our work with Bob and his team to help us update a lot of these standards to bring in those, you know, 21st century skills, some of the, the issues that we're all um, talking about. 
But I would also argue, you know, I think this is an area where apprenticeship can be a competitive advantage. I mean, I, I think we hear often from our employers that, you know, a, apprenticeship can move quicker than it will take a, a higher education to change their entire curriculum and design. So I, I think this is something that we should look at as a potential competitive advantage yeah. uh, to meet the needs of employers. Yeah, and I, and I mean, I would agree with that. I think that there's, uh, you know, the um, you know, technological innovation is happening faster in industry than it's happening in uh, in systems and uh, and um, curriculum. And uh, because of that, I think that in many cases, uh, an apprentice has a lot to teach um, has a lot to teach within the workplace and then when they're going to technical training if that technical training is connected to employers and is um, is receiving those that equipment that people are really working on it's a real opportunity to be able to say, you know, we've got, you know, a young, dynamic workforce kind of coming in. They have an understanding of technology. They're very comfortable with it. They're teaching journey persons and teaching uh, those in the workplace how to capture that and how to exploit it. And at the same time, employers, because they, they have to be on the cutting edge of their own industry, they're offering that. So it's a, I think it's uh, self-perpetuating. I think for Missouri, just real briefly, I, you know, so we, we went through, uh, over the summer we went through this initiative called Talent for Tomorrow, and basically we did a, uh, um, for the first time in about a decade, um, really since the Great Recession, we, we did a, a, a deep dive and, and did a, a heavy lift on a labor market analysis, and, and we kind of um, used that to help us kind of uh, reposition Missouri and what we're going to do with talent, uh, uh, talent design and talent development. And one of the things that we found was that in the Midwest states, the 14 Midwest states, so if you think of Minnesota to, to Arkansas and Nebraska to Ohio, Missouri was uh, one of the lower states, um, 13 I believe. Um, our businesses were taking advantage of technology uh, and AI and automation. I had a few conversations about this last night with the UK team. Um, at a slower rate than some of our peer states. And, and so we, we wanted to know why. Was it because they didn't have the money? Was it because uh, you know, maybe they don't have broadband? You know, what, were, what, were some of the, what were some of the issues? And so when we polled them, we were, we were kind of a surprised to find out that they were fearful that if they uh, brought in this new technology, their workforce would not be able to be equipped enough to do the job. And so we hear all the time about how the robots are going to take our jobs away. And, and you know, this, this tells you right here that employers are holding back because they need their employees uh, to learn how to use this technology. And so they need these new skills so that they, they can be more productive and not so they can, um, uh, you know, eliminate those jobs or remove those employees from the roster, but, but quite the opposite. They need them to help. Uh, implement that technology and help them become more productive. And so for us, I think that uh, it, it's about leveraging strong intermediaries that uh, can work closely with the employer, uh, that can, can facilitate kind of those quick changes that are necessary to help skill that workforce up in a way that uh, technology can be, uh, be adopted. Fantastic. Right, we're out of time. I think the people will be around. There are some questions at the back. I think most of us will be around in the break. Um, but thank you very much to John, Sarah, Marty and Simon for their time today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to the panel. There'll be a 15-minute break. We'll be back uh, at 11.
time after the forum to interact with uh, people. So if people can begin taking their seats for the second panel. I assure you it will be valuable, as valuable as the wonderful first panel. And uh, thanks to all the people in the first panel. Uh, so can people start uh, taking their seats? Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you. Oh, that's very nice. Yeah. Here the egg-shaped table. Right. You know. Yeah, that's good. Who are you with? Um, uh, independent Electrical Contractors. Oh, interesting. The, uh, trade mm -hmm. Association. So, yeah. And you're, are you here at the... I'm at the Swiss Embassy. Yeah. 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 So how long have you been here? Two years. Two years? Two years here in okay. D.C., yeah. Yeah, good. Good, good, good. How and long, uh, when, you, when will you... Start with the labs and stuff. It's yeah. not entirely clear. My contract is till the end of next year. So it's... Whoa! Not a year or so. <laughs> Good, good to meet you. Thank you, Bob, for doing the hard work. Um, so we're going to get started with the second panel today. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into what quality apprenticeships mean, how we're meeting industry demand, how we're meeting worker need, and how we're creating that quality apprenticeship framework. Um, my name is Katie Spiker. I'm Senior Federal Policy Analyst at National Skills Coalition. We're an advocacy organization that works broadly on ensuring access to a wide range of skills and skills policy issues um, for all workers and for businesses in all industries. We also, uh, just as a preview of some of the questions that I'm hoping to talk with you folks about, uh, work with a network of businesses, mostly small and medium-sized businesses, through what we call our Business <coughs> Leaders United for Workforce Partnerships group. Um, so I'm hoping to talk a little bit kind of about how these frameworks, what quality looks like for, for workers, for small businesses, for larger businesses, for businesses in industries that haven't been as uh, familiar with the apprenticeship pathway. Um, and so, so I'm going to dive right in. The first thing uh, that I'd like to do is introduce who I've got up here with me. Um, and I am excited to talk with uh, Thomas Burton, who folks will remember from the, the introductory comments, who's head of assessment with NOCN from uh, the UK. I've got Simon Marty, who's head of office of science, technology, and higher education at the Embassy of Switzerland. And Spencer Vilwak, who's the chief executive officer of independent electrical contractors uh, here in the US. Um, so I want to I wanna give you a kind of a broad question to kick things off. Um, and talk about occupational frameworks um, and really how do we develop them, how are we industry-led, and what, is a, what does that kind of framework system look like to creating an occupational uh, frame for thinking about apprenticeship? Um, I would like to hear from, from all three of you, but Simon, I'd love to start with you particularly since uh, we've heard from folks in the UK and the US about what apprenticeship and what those frameworks look like kind of broadly, but can you give us a little bit of a preview into what apprenticeship in Switzerland looks like and then talk a little bit about what those occupational frameworks look like in Switzerland? Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Good morning. Um, how many of you are familiar with Swiss apprenticeships, with apprenticeship in Switzerland? So already quite a few, but it's, I think it's, it's still worthwhile to dive a little bit into, into how the system works. I think one of the biggest differences with apprenticeship in other countries is that it's primarily youth apprenticeship in Switzerland. About 90% of all apprentices in Switzerland start between age 15 or 16, and apprenticeship uh, programs uh, last like three or four years usually. And it is a public-private partnership where, where companies play an important role. The government, we are also a federal country like the United States, so our cantons, which is our states, play a big role. They, uh, they are funding the schools, the vocational schools. The federal government plays uh, the role as a like, kind of supervisor and uh, assures that everything works, but oftentimes only steps in when there is really a big problem. And Probably the most important actors in Switzerland are, are the employers, often companies, but also public employers like hospitals or even, for instance, my home ministry has uh, apprentices. 
So that's a little bit in a nutshell how, how uh, the system is set up. It is permeable, it, it is an integral part of our overall education system. So you can start with an apprenticeship and then uh, move around and find your pathway in our education system. I also did that, for instance, I started with an apprenticeship as a lab, I'm a trained lab technician in chemistry and then f later on went to university and studied political science. And this is not an exceptional thing, it's something a lot of people do. Also important is that uh, about two-thirds of an age court in Switzerland do an, a, uh, do an apprenticeship. So it's really a very popular pathway. That's a little bit in a nutshell how it works. And what about some of it when in Switzerland when you're developing kind of the broad occupational framework? What's the process there? How do you bring industry together with the different canons and, and create that broad structure? So we have uh, apprenticeships in uh, 238 different uh, fields, different occupations, ranging from IT technicians to healthcare worker, uh, from uh, construction worker to lab technician. Uh, the commercial uh, apprenticeship is the most popular one. You, you, you can do that in, in a bank, for instance, insurance company. Uh, everything in every place where, you, where, where you, they need uh, commercial um, employees. And the uh, professional associations for, no, for all those 238 professions play a very important role in developing and, and uh, kind of uh, updating the, the curriculum. So it is compulsory that all those of those 238 uh, professions are updating their their curriculum, their curricula every every five years, which is quite a, um, a complex process. But the reason why we need to update them is because of technological change. And there are there are occupations where five years is not even enough because because technology is changing so so quickly. But the professional associations where companies are, are members, um, like we have umbrella organizations on the federal level, there are uh, professional associations on the cantonal level, so it's, it's a big um, network of associations. Uh, they, they can ask experts from, from individual companies to join committees where they work on the curricula development. So it's really important this collaboration in the individual sectors and they also ask uh, cantonal and federal um, experts to join. But it's really, like the, it's really shaped by the professional associations, this process. Yeah. Well, with that, I, I better turn to Spencer then. As a professional industry association in the U.S., Spencer. A wonderful segue. Um, yeah. Can you tell us about your process with independent electrical contractors and what, what your process looks like for creating a framework for, you have 50 uh, associations in, in the different states, so how are you as that national entity helping them devise what their programs look like on the ground? Uh, yeah, great question, and, and yeah, thanks for the <laughs> setup, Simon. Um, so I, I have kind of an interesting perspective to be able to bring to this. Um, we are a, a professional trade association focused on electrical renewable energy contractors and, and folks that are in the, the sphere of, of uh, systems work, so IT related and data communications, which is rapidly growing technology integrating into all, each one of those um, subsectors uh, and vertical markets that we focus on. Um, we, uh, on the national level, then we support uh, 51 different chapters um, and affiliates of IEC around the country supporting 2,400 different employers that are members of the association. And then um, we train, and our, and our uh, primary uh, focus of training is electrical apprenticeship. Um, we train in those 51 different centers. Not only that apprenticeship program, but also then additional value adds um, and uh, continuing education courses within jur different jurisdictions with local flavor as to what uh, regulatory environments are, are there, what market demands are there, et cetera. Um, we train uh, in the electrical apprenticeship program. We've got 12,000 apprentices uh, in, in our schools this academic year alone. Um, that's almost double where we were coming out of the recessionary period. So um, tremendous amount of growth that we've been going through. And I think uh, you know, the championship and, and leadership from the federal level, um, working with John Ladd and, and his team over at Department of Labor that we work very closely with, um, has really helped to then turn up the volume and, and bring much more of a uh, uh, um, much more exposure um, to the opportunities within uh, within apprenticeship in the United States. Um, 
our industry uh, you know, is, is a very mature one in, in, in that um, we've, uh, it's been our, our way of life, apprenticeship, for a long time. Um, and, and we are in this state of flux, is, is what's been discussed this morning. Um, so we, uh, we are, we've been actively contributing you know, to that framework and, and being able to then uh, meet the needs uh, to, uh, to be able to recruit folks in, be able to then train them with, with uh, the changing tides of industry for a number of years and um, are, are very pleased to see a number of other folks uh, in, in related industries and, and even disparate industries that are joining in the apprenticeship focus. So. And really um, building on the model that you all have, have established. Right, right, yeah. yeah. Um, now, Thomas, you talked a little bit in your introductory comments about what it looked like for the Trailblazer employers uh, to set some of these uh, frameworks. Um, can you go a little bit deeper? Can you give us maybe an example outside of the, the BP and I'm forgetting the other example you gave us. Um, uh, to about what, what, how, how they uh, come together to create those frameworks, what that looks like in the UK, particularly building off some of the information that, that we've heard about the Swiss and US models. So yeah, far. absolutely. Probably the, one of the best examples uh, outside of the two I gave this morning is, is, is maybe looking at the hospitality and service sector. Um, I myself was a chef after leaving high school, went to vocational college and, and, and went through the ladders. And, and what they did is bring key partners um, worldwide brands to, to um, have an influence on that, that particular standard. So you've got uh, Hilton Worldwide, you've got McDonald's, you've got Marriott, you've got quite a number of serious hospitality chains that, that, that view entry into the workforce as, as, as their future. Um, particularly that industry is, is, is often seen as uh, difficult to retain em employees within. So, you know, how do we make this a serious professional career in, in what usually is a transient <coughs> uh, uh, industry? Uh, so they looked at the standards, the occupations that were reviewed and, 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 and paired back actually what it is from a service sector, the, the key requirements of being, uh, of being a good employee. And, and that then starts to build, a, a, as you've been saying, a framework to say, well, you know, this is a particular skill that a, a housekeeper may need. This is a particular skill that a chef may need. And, and, but also the knowledge that goes along with that in terms of technical application, um, IT skills, um, you know, and then also, you know, what, how does that employee behave in that particular industry? You know, especially in hospitality where you are front facing with customers, just how that person should behave and, and, and interact with both uh, uh, internal uh, relations and, and external relations and, and then really putting it together you know in a jigsaw fashion that you know this is what the end product looks like and, and, and I referred to that this morning that employers um, in, in the UK apprenticeship model have a say in the end product what does it look like when that apprentice is finished and that's really a, a key focus for in the development is when it gets to the end what does that person look like? How do they behave? What skills do they have, and what technical knowledge can they uh, can they uh, draw on and use in their work in their workplace? One of the things that the first panel uh, talked about, and we had a really good discussion about, was the the necessary flexibility between. Uh, national standards and what different employers need as far as developing skills for their workforce. Um, one of the, the pieces that I wanted to go a little bit deeper in in that conversation is particularly for, for small or medium sized businesses. It's easy and a lot of the examples that we hear from folks are about what large national and multinational corporations um, are doing. Uh, I will, Spencer, I'll let you have the last word on this because as aggregating a lot of some of the smaller contractor piece, I think that that's one way we see it happening in the United States is that industry associations step in um, and listen to the voice of their, their smaller companies. But, but in what other ways do you have engagement from small to medium-sized businesses in that process? Well, I, I suppose not to steal uh, my colleague's funder, that the construction sector in the UK, although there is uh, serious amounts of, of large employers and, and, and large uh, organizations, a lot of the actual work is then subcontracted to, to individual electrical firms or plastering firms or, or bricklaying firms, which may be only one, two members of staff, which then themselves used to be probably apprentices that have come through on, in a similar system. And, and that, the, 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 what we call the SME market in, in the UK is, is where we historically have seen a lot of apprentices come from. Uh, yes, there's the, the, the great uh, large employers like the Hiltons and Barclays and BP, but historically in, in the UK, a lot of apprentices came from the SMEs. And what we have seen is, is, is almost their voice does get lost because the, the, you know, the Hiltons say, want this standard and Barclays want this standard. And, but you know, the, the, what you refer to in the U US as uh, 
uh, mile and par joints, uh, you know, that that message is often difficult to get out. So, so really, one of the criticisms that that we do here in the UK is that, you know, the the, the one man bands or two man bands that, that are in and around areas like construction and hospitality often get left behind from it. what do they want. In terms of how that's then delivered, I, I suppose uh, one caveat that I always use um, with apprenticeship standards in the UK is that it is very much delivered in the context of that particular employer. So one of the pe uh, feedback I always get from, from uh, train providers and employers is that it's not specific enough for what I do. It doesn't go, it doesn't tell an apprentice that they must do this. And that's intentional because the context of what that um, uh, apprentice does with that particular employee will be different from the guys next door. So, you know, the employer and the train provider in the UK, you know, work on, well, what do you want as an apprentice for your, organ you know, for this organisation and, and, and making sure that if it is a small business, that their views are taken into account, but also if they're going to be an apprentice with, you know, a, a small organisation, that they're still meeting those national industry recognised standards that, you know, the Hiltons and the Barclays and the BPs of the world want to see. What about in Switzerland? How are you engaging small, medium-sized business voice in uh, developing some of those national frameworks? So we have about um, a bit more than 35% of all companies or employers in Switzerland train apprentices. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of them are, s are small and medium businesses. But um, in many cases, really small businesses, they would train an apprentice or two uh, and then maybe not train for a few years because it's part of their HR strategy. Mm -hmm. So it's... But still, if they want to train, they would need um, to have a trainer for the practical part because apprenticeship in Switzerland is, is uh, in most cases dual, like part-time in school and part-time in the company. So, but also the company, the apprentices are always with a, with a trainer, with a mentor who has the training uh, to do that. And so they could not, like, not train for a few years and then all of a sudden start without having a trainer who is really... Uh, um, basically certified to do that. So it's, it's, um, it's for the small and medium businesses, especially the small ones, it's, it's really uh, depending whether, they, uh, w whether it fits into their, their current needs. Mm -hmm. And they might really stop training for a few years and then start again. Mm -hmm. And typically, uh, I have to add that in Switzerland, companies, typically our economists, um, educational economists say that um, in Switzerland, companies really train because it's in their economic interest. It's not, of course, there might be elements of, of um, idealism or, or uh, for the greater good, but, but it's, it's mainly in their, in their own interest. So when, when, you analyze, when you analyze in Switzerland, the, the economic case for apprenticeships in Switzerland, you see that overall companies make a benefit when they, when they train apprentices already during those three or four year programs. And then even those who do not make a profit during the three or four year programs, when you look at the costs they would face if they would have to hire someone instead of retaining an apprentice, they still make a profit already after a year. Because if they would hire someone, even someone uh, who is already trained from the, from the labor market, they would still make have to have to train them in to the specifics of their company whereas a, an apprentice would already know everything because they were there like three or four years mm -hmm. so i think i think that's very important to understand we do not push companies it's completely uh, voluntary whether a company uh, uh, participates in or, or an employer participates in uh, in our apprenticeship system but overall they do because um, because of an economic interest. And that's yeah. a good point about thinking about what quality means in apprenticeship is that then that is a good way to, as, to serve as an ambassador and bring other companies and businesses into using the model. Right. Um, so Spencer, what about in, in the US and mm -hmm. as an industry association, which is the voice of small business contribute to the quality conversation? Yeah, well, I think there's, there's several different layers that are there. Um, one, I think, there's, there's, there's a lot of conversation around standardization and, and so, um, from the national perspective, then you know, we work with uh, U.S. Department of Labor to be able to create uh, standard standards of apprenticeship, which then get personalized, as, as the gentleman from Missouri was talking about, then into the local levels, mm -hmm. local jurisdictions, put their local flavor on it, um, so to speak. But and and then there was also conversation around transferability of skill um, from one. 
company to the next. Um, it's a mobile workforce, especially in the construction trade. Um, we have continuing demands on, on skills gaps for individuals that, that are, we, we can't hire people fast enough in, in the construction trades in, in the United States today. And, and so there's, there's a lot of uh, people moving from, from company to company. So there's that standardization piece is absolutely critical to be able to then give the overall skills that an individual then needs. Um, there's an, also an interesting marriage between what, as, as the trade association, uh, what we do for the um, curriculum and the practical or the, the, uh, the theoretical aspects of what we do in controlled environments within student laboratories, et cetera, mirrored with then um, the, the apprenticeship model of working with on-the-job learning. That on-the-job learning then is a commitment from employers to be able to then hit certain conduits, if you will. Um, Sorry, it's an electrical joke. Uh, I've got it. I've got certain it. conduits, thank you. <laughs> conduits of, of, of uh, related instruction you know, and, and, and practical nature on, on the job, in which then is personalized. It's, it, you know, that, that business is then focusing on being able to then deploy that, that apprentice to different areas to be able to gain those hours of experience, but yet it's contributing then to the overall style of work, you know, the company culture, et cetera, that's there as well. So, so I think that. Um, I think that many times uh, small business owners are reluctant um, because they don't see the overall benefit. Mm -hmm. um, but then, as, as uh, Simon just mentioned too, that once they get in, then they start to see then that, that return on investment. And, and it becomes a moot point to be able to then gain a stronger, broader perspective for, for individuals as to their skill set. Um, and, and it's really all about the apprentice uh, as well. So. Uh, giving him or her that, that opportunity to be able to get ahead in their, their career. So I, at this point I have to uh, cite to you for maybe the third or fourth time today one of Bob's papers that does you know hit exactly on this point that of businesses that are running apprenticeships something like 94 percent of them would highly recommend them to their peers so um, uh, but but also then building off of what you were just talking about about evaluating some of that on-the-job training component so we've talked about kind of broadly the frameworks, but getting down to the different actual components of an individual apprenticeship. How, uh, how in the UK and Switzerland and in your programs here in the US, are you all evaluating that that, that on-the-job training component is meeting the needs of the industry? Yeah, absolutely. That the, the, and some of my colleagues talked about the split between um, the 80% delivered on the job and the 20% delivered uh, either especially in Canada in the technical uh, college or, or technical train providers the, the the apprentice spends most of the time with the employer mm -hmm. so th there has to be some structure to what they do with that employer especially if they are into an industry that they've never worked in before never been a part of before you know what's their wh what's their program of learning and development look like um, because often we see um, employers taking an apprentice as a uh, as a way to you know tick a box and you know uh, uh, establish a PR um, uh, drive, but actually, what is that apprentice learning while they're with that employer? And especially in areas such as medical, uh, areas such as the construction, um, you know, actually, for somebody to become competent at the end, it, it's quite a long progression progression route. So there has to be some structure by that employer to say, you know, this is what you're going to learn while you're on program. Um, where we do see apprentices uh, see apprentices struggle where, is where that structure is not in place. Um, so you know, often a conversation that I have when I'm, I'm talking to employers is that you know, think about what you are going to do with your apprentice. How are they going to learn about your organisation, about your expect the industry expectations, and making sure that when they get to a, a, a point of completion, that those skills, knowledges, and behaviours that are, that are written into the fabric of our apprenticeship standards are, are achieved. Because without that, it just fails the apprentice. Mm -hmm. And what about in Switzerland? Yeah. So in in, in Switzerland. Um, you have like basically you have three places where apprentices learn in school, in a company, and industry-wide courses that are organized by the professional associations. So you have during the three or four years, you always are in touch with with trainers, and they all know that in the end you need to pass the exam, and that exam is not assessed uh, like by the just by the company uh, people or trainers. So they are always experts from outside. So there is a, they have a big interest to make sure that they cover everything that was defined and uh, updated every five year the curricula. That, so they have a big interest to to cover that. Uh, larger companies they have processes in place. For instance, where where they have the trainers, the mentors in the work in the workplace, 
who have like a, a supervisor who makes sure that, that uh, all those trainers actually train the apprentices the right thing. So there are like um, certain reporting requirements. Yeah. It's not very bureaucratic. I've, I've seen it <laughs> myself when I did it, but it's still, it makes sure that for all uh, methods you have to learn, there is an assessment, mm -hmm. an ongoing assessment. And because the apprenticeship takes like three or four years, you do that typically every semester. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like before the final exam and mm -hmm. then the final exam would really reveal uh, whether someone uh, was trained well and uh, yeah and I mean companies have a big interest to make sure that no one fails or very few fails and if a few fail it's okay but if if uh, consistently in a company uh, people fail to pass the final exam and many people fail uh, they could lose the, the right basically to train it happens, but it happens seldomly. Mm -hmm. So on the company level, on the school level, and on the company level, the professional associations play a big role in assuring that quality. And of course, if if there is a, a larger problem, it's always also supervised by the our equivalent of your states, like the, by the cantons. And um, in the in the school part, like the vocational school part, it's the cantons mm -hmm. uh, who play a role, and th there it's, it works similar that the final exams are, are not just like with experts from the schools, but they're also experts coming in to, mm -hmm. to make sure that everything is, is going right. So you yeah. can, I'm sure, draw the corollaries then here to how you all run those programs and the experts that, that are evaluating and ensuring that that on-the-job component is meeting industry needs. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, and, and, and we, we, have a, we have very similar um, supervisory type of relationships and within the electrical industry then there's there's typically there's a ratio of j a journey person to an apprentice and and so there's direct oversight um, for those individuals on the job sites which is is true mentorship in, in so many different ways so it's it's reinforcing everything that's happening and within that job that particular project as well as then the the, the uh, pathway um, through that individual's career and, and working their way up through their apprenticeship their apprenticeship piece um, I think that the the on the job learning aspects um, uh, there there again the, the 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 kind of the the big boxes if you will of, uh, provide a lot of flexibility for employers to be able to then um, accommodate for the the needs within uh, different disciplines to be able to then meet those requirements of on the job learning um, the science behind uh, electron flow to, and, and uh, the, the the practical nature of, of electricity is not necessarily changing it's the technology and the the application of technology um, that is rapidly changing uh, in the last five years and will continue to uh, in the years ahead <coughs> and one of the the uh, the um, one of the key pieces that, that is paid attention to within, within the American system is, is uh, um, another, another association that puts together um, the National Electrical Code, which is updated on, on a three-year basis in which then that goes through all the, the practical implications, safety implications, new technologies that are coming online. So there's several different um, barriers to entry, if you will. Products just can't come into the, into the workplace. Um, and so then our curriculum then teaches to that and then also then on the, all the on, jo on the job learning then works to accommodate and, and hit that piece. So, so I think there's, there's a lot of uh, flexibility mm -hmm. that employers have um, within the, the current structure as it is. One of the things that I, I want to shift gears a little bit to focus on and just to give folks a head up, heads up, um, for folks online, uh, you can submit your questions to events at urban.org um, and we'll turn to questions in uh, just about seven minutes. But um, one more question from me for the folks on the panel is um, we have talked in, in this conversation a lot about measuring quality by how uh, apprentices, apprentices are reaching the kind of skills and, and experience necessary to meet industry need. Another real piece of defining quality is ensuring that programs meet apprentices' needs and that we're structuring programs in a way that enable both access to and retention in programs. Um, uh, Spencer, you made the comment. Was that me? Sorry. <laughs> My hair. Uh, you made the comment that uh, there, there is this skills gap and we've got, you know, we've got more uh, jobs opening than, than workers to fill it. And one of the ways that a lot of the conversation is focused on ensuring that we're, you know, reaching industry need mm -hmm. is by ensuring that the broadest range and diversity of stakeholders really have access to strong apprenticeships. Um, 
NOCN does a, an analysis of equality diversity in training programs broadly, um, but I'd love to hear from each of you all how, you're, how you think about the quality and defining quality of apprenticeships based in, in serving apprentice needs, whether it's ensuring access, ensuring, or ensuring the kind of retention like access to support services or things like that that enable people to really continue through programs. Sure, yes. I think one of the, 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 the biggest things that, that, that vocational training does, and, and um, we were talking about it in the Canada model earlier, is that it often uh, attracts people into vocational apprenticeships or training that, that didn't feel their needs were being fulfilled in the acad traditional academic routes. And that's, the, that's the very much the same uh, in the UK. Uh, and I, I, th I think that's the, the, the entire point of an apprenticeship. The, uh, if you wanted to have an academic route and go to university and, and complete your degree, you know, that's great and you, you know, there's going to be a certain field that you'll work in, that's fantastic. A lot of people uh, across all the countries that we've got represented today often aren't academic in terms of their application of knowledge and skills. And, and that's really, uh, it really finds a, a place for them in, in the apprenticeship world or the vocational world that allows them to access uh, you know, learning materials and development so they can progress their, their, their life. Uh, and I think the, the whole point of, of, of training and, and education is that at some point the, the so your social mobility is going to improve. You know, if you, I, I personally started off at a fairly low level of education after leaving high school. Um, and only through uh, training and education, uh, you know, be it my qu uh, qualifications in hospitality uh, and then obviously uh, education, has allowed my social mobility to increase. And that's very much the point of, of, of what an apprentice should be, is that at the heart of it is, th is that person that's going to learn and develop and, and, and be educated, not only to increase their, their prosperity, but the prosperity of the employer that they're working with. You know, so the productivity um, discussion that, that is in all countries um, and, and agendas at the moment is, is, can be very much fixed with the education of, of young people and, and, and young adults and, and, and the rest of their workforce in being able to skill them right in terms of um, what that industry needs, but also give them knowledge so that they can apply themselves better and be more pro uh, productive, you know, thus talking about return on investment, you know, ensuring that that employer sees the value in it um, and I think in terms of a, engaging a wider um, uh, sort of pu uh, employment pool if you like from a, um, th these employees point of view is, is that's one of the key uh, successes that people talk to me about is that up, uh, traditionally maybe in financial services they would recruit graduates they would they would see somebody with a degree as that's their pool of, of, of employment that's been widened now and, and one of the, the greatest successes I've seen in the UK is that they've been able to attract people from a very diverse nature that they wouldn't usually see. So, you know, traditional people with degrees going into financial services has now been widened out to people that have got the, the, the right behaviours and the right personal attributes to make a difference to that employment. <coughs> uh, and the, the recruitment pool has, you know, gone up tenfold because they're just not looking at graduates anymore. That's a really great outcome. What about in Switzerland? I think the beautiful thing about Swiss apprenticeship is really that it does not only help the needs of the employers but really also of the students and I think that explains also why it's still so popular in Switzerland that we have like more than two-thirds of an age court doing it and I think uh, one of the biggest things um, it helps for the for the apprentices is that they get really a good education that helps them to to enter the labor market at age 18 and 19 and basically start a career and and then together with further education they can then they, they can really have a, a great career um, we have a lot of people who are CEOs now of, of big Swiss companies and, and they they never did a, a university degree or something they started with an apprenticeship so it's really very relevant for the labor market another thing however it provides the uh, the apprenticeship system provides to young people is those who like to move to uh, higher education for instance or to other pathways it provides them a very robust uh, base to start from and uh, yeah you asked also how we make sure that people can really uh, follow through and do their apprenticeship um, there's a support system in place because I mean uh, some people are not ready yet at age 15 not just in terms of deciding what they want to do but some uh, would like to do one apprenticeship but are not there yet where they would need to be in terms of uh, uh, requirements in languages or mathematics or, or other 
or other subjects. So there is a possibility to do like a, we, we don't have K to 12, we have K to nine. So there's the possibility to do a 10th school year, for instance. There is a counseling in place uh, on the cantonal level that's provided by the, by the cantonal authorities. And also, uh, once you start an apprenticeship, often uh, young people try to do an apprenticeship including a so-called vocational baccalaureate, which would, which, which, uh, would uh, lead towards a credential that gives you free access, meaning access without an exam, to a University of Applied Science afterwards. So a lot of people start with that, and if they cannot keep up like, with the pace and with, with all the requirements, they would not initially drop out already uh, out of that apprenticeship. They might just uh, enter the, the regular apprenticeship pathway if they would not be able to, to really manage the whole uh, uh, requirements if uh, they would start with at the beginning. So there are ways to, to for instance, if it's too much, they, they could still do an apprenticeship. It's also possible, by the way, to, to do the vocational baccalaureate after the apprenticeship. So I think, uh, and also some students might find out, so apprentices might find out that it's the wrong field for them. Mm -hmm. So we, ha we have, it, it really depends. In some fields, like ICT apprenticeship, I think retention rate is really very high. But in others, students find out that it's not, not what they have expected, and then they might do another apprenticeship, maybe. So it's really about providing on-ramps and then options right, once yeah. they're in apprenticeship. Yeah, we have a motto that there is basically no off-ramp without another on-ramp. <laughs> I like it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Spencer, what about what about in your programs? Yeah. Um, well, I think I think <coughs> in general, I think we have we have we have a vocational equity issue in the United States and and perhaps in other countries as well, um, in which um, we have uh, stripped away a lot of uh, opportunities for exposure within the vocational trades through a K through 12 system over the course of the last few decades, um, which then have, has then <coughs> not explicitly but implicitly then said to the American people that this is a lesser career opportunity. Um, so we got that stacked against us and then at the same time then we've had uh, growing disparity between um, uh, our parents being able to be at home and raising our young children and, and having two workers to be able to then support our, our folks that are there and we've then relied on an overburdened K-12 through system to be able to raise our children. Soapbox, I'll step off. Um, so with all that parameters, all those parameters kind of stacked against us, then we've tried to create um, more of the, the on-ramps, off-ramps, and, and create more empowerment um, to the way vocational trades are looked at, and, and specifically then again, you know, the electrical industry. So we need to change the language that we use about ourselves. We need to empower ourselves that are currently within the industry um, to be able to then serve that need. Um, the education is there. The education is solid. The model is there. We all know from that we've, we're, in this, we're in this fight together. We all see the benefit that it provides individuals within their personal lives and their professional lives to be able to then have social mobility, be able to get ahead, be a, a strong contributing member to their not only their communities but also their families and become that anchor person. But we forgot to bring along the messaging and, and the, the importance along that pathway to be able to say that that um, uh, just because just because coming out of high school, then um, somebody doesn't know, that they've been messaged to that, that it's a college or bus mentality and they don't necessarily want to work from the neck up only, they want to work fully integrated body and into everything that they're doing that, that they don't know where to go. And so they're left to their own devices. So, and, and I, I blame industry too for continuing to use the word apprenticeship. Um, even though that we've t turned a lot of, of volume up on apprenticeship recently, that's not what people are attuned to. That's not what they're typing in Google late at night trying to figure out what to do with their lives. So we need to re-message and rebrand ourselves in a different way to be able to attract individuals. We need to also not talk about apprenticeship as the end all be all, but that's the means to the end. We need to start focusing on the, the end game as to that what the benefits are that then we all know, highly profitable, highly paying jobs, highly skilled, et cetera, um, of which then that will help to create the conduit for further retention of the individuals that are in it, further empowerment, further growth of the industry, and then, then attraction to uh, the industry from new career seekers. So. Right, so it's a whole pathway of aligning with the education system as well as the workforce system. So I want to open up questions to, to folks here and then remind uh, the online audience to uh, submit questions to events at urban.org. Um, 
do folks in the audience have any questions? While you're thinking of what uh, you want to ask, we did have one submitted online um, from Ariane Hegowicz from uh, Institute for Women's Policy Research. Um, and uh, Ariane has done a lot of work on uh, apprenticeships in traditionally male-dominated industries. Um, and so she's um, asking about ideas for how we could expand access to for women in male-dominated industries, as well as ensuring that when we're talking about a broad expansion of apprenticeship in, in new industries, that we're creating opportunities for men and women in those industries. How and So what are some of the lessons we can learn from what's happening in the UK and Switzerland? Yeah, I mean, I mentioned the BP uh, Chemicals um, Organization and, and their apprentices. Um, they've, they've had this oil and gas terminal for the best part of 50 years. And until the advent of uh, the apprenticeship reforms in the UK, they'd never had a female apprentice on their program in the best part of 50 years. And they've got five this year. That's great. In a heavily dominated male industry, where, How? There's, where there's wrenches, there's, you know, uh, and p purely through just, just thinking differently, just thinking, well, you know, it's not because you're a man that, you know, you can wrench on a, on a, on a, on a uh, you know, a, a valve or, or it is, it's about being able to apply yourself in that industry, you know, and they've got five you know, unbelievably um, talented uh, ladies that are working um, in, very spe in a very specialist field that's uh, not had, and, and they just had to go uh, to the wider geographical area, mm -hmm. linked in with schools, linked in with uh, colleges in the UK, um, social ma media had a massive uh, uh, impact on how they recruited so they they just dragged themselves from from quite archaic in terms of their recruitment to, to thinking differently and learning from other sectors and you know looking how financial services have done it or looking how, how the hospitality sector uh, you know attract different different d uh, demographics and just thinking well you know if we want the right person for this job you know <coughs> gender's got to be off the table because it's it's about application of, of skill and knowledge and, and then you know being able to be competent in what you have to do. That's great. Anyone, I, I'll give, uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, it's uh, quite an uneven picture in Switzerland. Like we have occupations like in the healthcare or the social work field where, where you have many more women mm -hmm. than, uh, than men. And then obviously it's more the STEM related fields uh, where, where there are clearly more men than, than women commercial field, which is the largest, uh, also retail, I think it's quite even. And uh, what we do in the STEM field, because it is clearly also our, in our interest to attract more women to the STEM fields, um, we start early with, with uh, STEM education already in some cantons, already on kindergarten level <laughs> or uh, elementary school level to try to change that, but it's very, it's very difficult. Uh, but however, what I've heard, um, from, from companies in Switzerland, like in a technical field, like mechanical engineering or, or ICT, if they do have women, and they often have like only about 20% or a quarter of, of the total apprentices, uh, they tend to be really good. They tend to be, and that's probably also a reason why they want more, <laughs> more of them, yeah. Um, I think we'd, we've been trying to, yeah, the, the construction trade has is, is typically been a very male-dominated field and, and continues to be, and, and um, we have been trying to lead by example in a lot of ways by, by being able to then feature um, females that are in the industry in prominent positions. Um, for example, we at, at our last we have an annual convention, which a lot of professional trade associations do for um, continuing education, networking, etc. Um, we had our, our first um, female keynote speaker um, this past year, um, focused on on business principles and really driving that message forward. Um, we've we've had panel discussions in, in the last year and a half, um, also led by um, women within the construction industry to be able to then help to then broadcast that message. Mm -hmm. um, and then next year um, will be our first uh, president, uh, elected president of of the association. I'll be stepping into that role. So, so we've been really trying to be able to widen our aperture um, because it, it, it's going to take a cultural shift, of course, on our job sites across the country as well um, as to um, how things are looked at, where, where you know, anything from, from uh, you know, placement of, of uh, um, break rooms all through, you know, like the, just to be able to, to, be able to um, you know, serve by example that way. So we've really been trying to, to turn up the volume as much as we possibly can. But, um, Hoping, I was hoping some of my colleagues would have that silver bullet to be yeah. able to share with us <laughs> from, uh, from across, across the ocean. But. 
Um, so uh, are they, if, there, if there aren't any questions in the audience, we've got, we've got about five minutes left. I've got one more question for folks. Um, anyone who I'm denying a chance? Okay, so um, what, uh, what can we learn from what policymakers have done in the UK, in Switzerland, or at the, uh, at the industry level here in the US? Where do you see the opportunity for US policymakers to help ensure quality uh, in apprenticeships? And I, whomever would like to start, because that's not one I gave anyone a heads up about. I'll, I'll go first, give you guys a, a chance to, to formulate your answer. Um, I, I think the, the, the quality um, ag agenda and, and discussion in the UK is, is one that's ongoing and evolving. Um, it, we've, we've gone through a, um, a rather swift change in, in how apprenticeships are delivered, assessed and then uh, certificated in the UK. And, uh, and some of the elements of the system are, are, are still in sort of a... Div just past the developmental phase, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there's much of let, let's let's see how it goes. What you know, how, what where's the risks lie, B because it, it's a complete change from what we used to have. Um, saying that, though, I, I think if you have at the heart of what you you're doing either as a, a a training provider or a college or the employer, if you are focused on the end product of your program, be it from the provider or the employer, that that person has to then the day after their apprenticeship is finished go into the work. And, and be able to be competent in, in whatever skill and industry they're working. If that's the focus and that's what drives you, your agenda, the, the quality will, will follow. I, I think if you, you come at it from a, a view of, I'm just using apprenticeships to, to fill gaps or be cheap labor, it, it will undermine itself. Mm -hmm. It will undermine itself. You know, we, in, in the UK, we, we're subject to, to quite a number of regulators um, and, and that often causes it, consistency issues. But at the heart of it, if you are delivering the right training to the right learner or the, the right apprentice with the right program and the right support, then the quality will, will automatically follow. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you disengage from that, there's going to be an issue. So consistent employer engagement, voice Absolutely. in the process, and ensuring that apprentices are engaged Absolutely. as well. Yeah. Can we, what can we learn from Switzerland? So what I hear is that the, how to assure quality in the end, like when, when uh, the final exams take place and uh, when, when it would basically come out if there would be a major uh, quality issue. Uh, obviously that is important, but what is even more important is the, that quality plays a role all along the way. Because if, if it would just be like the final exams and how that's managed, it would not clearly not be enough. So what, what plays a role is that all the trainers in the workplace are well trained also themselves mm -hmm. and the same is true of course for uh, for teachers so so it's uh, to become a, a teacher for a vocational school is has basically the same requirements uh, as as for uh, teachers in academic high yeah. schools in switzerland and even a little bit more they also need a uh, practical experience so i think i think that plays a big role and also the robustness of uh, the, the professional associations mm -hmm. And they really, they really are proud about their vocation and make, want to make sure that they can keep up with everything. And I think it is less just a regulatory thing, even though we have uh, regulatory things in place that make sure that quality re remains high. But because, because we have this strong link to the actual uh, workplace, to the actual labor market, it, it wouldn't work. Uh, the whole apprenticeship system wouldn't work if the quality would be, mm -hmm. would, would be bad because uh, companies wouldn't have any interest to participate in it or to retain mm -hmm. um, the apprentices in the end. So high quality mentors, high quality instructors, and really right. engagement with industry. Yeah. yeah, and Spencer, I'll give you the last word. You bet. Yeah, I, I think that continued engagement with the industry, I think is absolutely <coughs> critical of, of our lawmakers and regulators is, is to um, having that inherent understanding that, that we're all in this together. We're, we're all working together towards common goals and um, we want to have safe workplace practices, safe work environments. We want to have um, progressive laws uh, to be able to then help to allow for um, the expansion of, of everything that, that we're doing as a society and, and as businesses. Um, but but f yeah, working to engage our, our businesses all along that, that pathway is, is absolutely critical. So having the, the feedback mechanisms um, and forums to be able to then discuss policies and making sure we're, we're shaping common sense policies that work for all. Great. Well, with that, I will turn it over. I will thank my panelists for their thoughtful comments and turn it over to Bob and Tom. Katie, thank you very much indeed for concluding the, uh, the second panel. I'm sure everybody 
present and those watching online have uh, found those two panels uh, really fascinating. And as someone that's got a perspective over the last sort of four tapes, I think today was really the one where it was less about the, the sort of stratospheric policy stuff that's going on, which goes on in all our countries around apprenticeship, but it was very much a deep dive into this question about how do we actually assure quality in our um, respective apprenticeship models. And for me, just reflecting just for a few moments on really what I heard today in terms of commonality, it seems to me actually we've got probably more in common about our systems than we have at face value um, the differences. because. Everybody that spoke today obviously made this point in various forms that, you know, without employers, you don't have apprenticeships. So the starting point absolutely has to be with the employer. It's a real occupational role, paying a um, salary. And it is about the structured uh, on-the-job training and off-the-job training. I think where it got interesting is really this uh, perhaps sort of tension, and it was summed up I think, by one of the panel members who talked about this challenge between standardization versus flexibility because actually arguably from what you've heard from my colleagues uh, about some of the reforms that we're going through uh, in England um, really where the debate is is uh, an argument for more flexibility around our uh, system and at times I heard from you know American colleagues today probably an argument for a bit more standardization so there's a Goldilocks uh, zone somewhere between standardization around your apprenticeship model, occupational standards, testing regimes and what have you, and also uh, giving employers, importantly, the flexibility. But there's also this other element, which is, of course, about the apprentice themselves, because if we were developing our apprenticeship models in our respective countries purely for a single employer for the job tasks and roles of today, then arguably we're shortchanging particularly our young people, but also those adults who, yes, need a job. They want a job with skill. They want the mastery and the dignity that comes, of course, with work. But this is about creating, through our apprenticeship model, uh, a system that allows our economies over time to grow our productivity. And by growing our productivity, it's a bit of a kind of labor market technical term that, but actually it comes down to one very simple thing, and that's the living standards that we all enjoy um, as citizens. And without growth in productivity, then we're just not going to do that. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you for all the contributions. It's been a fascinating um, discussion today. Obviously, I'd like to thank Haley and all the team at uh, Urban Institute who do such a fantastic job at organising this and of course the, uh, the skilled technicians who are behind the scenes but they're in the AV booth who've actually made it possible for people from wherever they are from around the world and it's been great to see so much activity on Twitter you know people are using every single device possible I think there's probably one because it came from a government building um, I think they were probably uh, blocked via a firewall from accessing uh, the Urban Institute's webcast today, but they still managed to get their smartphone out with their 4G connection and make it happen. And I think that just goes to show the ingenuity of uh, Marty, your yeah, of um, um, uh, of your fellow civil servants. So, without further ado, I'm going to hand it over then to the star of the show just to close uh, <laughs> close the fourth annual TAFE forum. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Bob Lerman. Thank you. Yeah, well, Tom and I are in agreement. I'm just going to say a few substantive points and then uh, thank everyone uh, again. Um, you know, I agree with Tom about this issue of flexibility versus standardization. Uh, one of the things, though, that happens uh, is that if you're going to have government funding, then presumably it does have the, the training and the uh, accomplishment of an apprenticeship has to go beyond that individual firm. And so that's, that's, that's really key. And so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Um, there's no correlation between the number of, the absolute number of, quote, apprenticeable uh, uh, occupations that have been apprenticed and the share of the workforce in apprenticeships. Um, so Switzerland has 238, and they have two-thirds of their people going into apprenticeship. Germany has about 350, and they have about 55% going into apprenticeship. Uh, we have over 1,000 <laughs> in some sense, uh, and we have a, a lot fewer. 
So that's that's one thing. But so so, I think one of the issues to address is even when we do have frameworks or standards or competency-based frameworks, how wide and how narrow should they be? It's not just the flexibility, but what are we talking about when we say there's an occupation that should that can use apprenticeship? Second point, uh, quickly, is what we have found in the United States where there's not a lot of money uh, that employers will latch on to for apprenticeships is that a huge number of employers, they don't want to go to a lot of meetings. <laughs> they, don't, they don't want to spend hours and days and weeks sitting in rooms with other employers hashing out what the standards should be for that occupation. We have uh, issues even getting them to respond to something that's already laid out well. And uh, so I think it's a mistake to think that sort of, well, it's employer-led, so employers are going to do all this. You do need that coordination, whether it be through professional service organizations or some public-private uh, entity like the Institute for Apprenticeship uh, for that to come about. And one of the things we've seen in the United States in the last couple of years is that organizations that are getting funding from the government to help stimulate apprenticeships, one of the very first things they do is to say, well, we have to start writing a st standard. We have to start writing a framework that will be accepted. Uh, and they spend a huge amount of time doing that as opposed to taking something that's already well worked out and use that to persuade the much harder job, use that in persuading employers in this country to adopt apprenticeship. So I think um, all these issues are very uh, interesting. There's no one single right answer. But I think we want to be realistic about how employers interact with the, with the system, um, how uh, it's important to think about the, the breadth of the occupation versus the narrowness of the occupation. And yes, have some flexibility, but also, especially when there's government funding, have some accountability that this person is going to be well trained in that occupation. So with that, those, that, those reflections, I, uh, I do want to thank everybody again for, for coming. I think it's been a fascinating effort. Uh, this will be our last uh, one here at this building, maybe not the last uh, Transatlantic Apprenticeship Forum. Uh, we're going to be moving, Urban Institute is going to be moving to a wonderful new building. What's the address? Hey, do you know the address? 500 LaFont Plaza. That's not really a street, but it's, <laughs> it's a place. Um, and uh, let's hope we can all convene. Uh, and we will have seen both increases in quality and in quantity over the next period of time. So thanks again, and thanks to all of our, uh, our friends from across the pond and from Canada uh, who have come such a long way uh, to educate us and uh, help us move our systems forward. Thanks.